And gentlemen, may we please have your attention for this public safety announcement. This is the Printworks Conference Center. The Printworks Conference Center has eight emergency exits. Exit signs will remain illuminated at all times. Please take a moment to check the exit nearest you, bearing in mind that it may be behind you. In the event of emergency, you will be asked to proceed to the exit and move down the steps to the assembly point located in the lower castle yard beside the church. For your convenience, restrooms are located out the doors to the left. Please ensure that mobile phones are switched to silent while in the Printworks Conference Center and remember that this is a no smoking and no vaping building. Tomage Lechela, we are together. Our score Echela a Warren Adina. Under the shelter of each other, people survive. The old Irish principle of Mel relates to community. We seem to have a little bit of an issue with the video there, but it started quite strongly. I think we can all agree uh, on the theme of that one. We will try and play it to you over the next couple of days. Tomage Lechela. We are together. Our score Echela a Warren Adina. Under the shelter of each other, people survive. The old Irish principle of Mel relates to community support. After all, Nin Yartgakur Lechela. There is no strength without unity. Our native language reflects who we are and how we think. Tome and Shah in Mask Mavincher. I am here among my people. Ta era imachri. This land is in my heart. And it's this Irishness that helps us shape the world as a place to give and not to take. And the more we share, the more we have. And that's its magic. Our undriach, as we say as So welcome here again. Falcha and Shah Arish. It was worth the second row, wasn't it? Definitely. Good morning, everyone. It is lovely to have you here for the third Global Irish Civic Forum. Lekela Arish together again. I think it summed it up there in the video, and I think from all the conversations we're hearing so far, it is certainly a very fitting theme considering all we've been through over the last couple of years. Now, my name is Sarah Mulkerns and I'm going to be your MC for the next couple of days. So you don't need to do a thing. Just sit back, relax. I will direct you and point you and prod you into every single direction that we will have to go. So all you need to do is relax and listen. And I know there have been plenty of stimulating conversations already. There was a wonderful reception at Epic last night and the conversations have flowed on this morning, accompanied by that wonderful Piper as well. I really enjoyed my morning walk in here into the surrounds. Definitely big round of applause. Um, so obviously we're going to look forward to a couple of days of stimulating and interesting discussion on all the topics uh, that you're all so familiar with. Um, and I think, you know, it's going to be a brilliant forum over the next couple of days. So just a couple of bits of housekeeping that I will continually remind you about. Um, what you have is the um, hard copy of the brochure. There is a QR code there. So we're all familiar with how this all works now. So all you need to do is scan that and you will get an electronic copy of the events and the brochures for the next couple of days. In the interests of protecting the environment and our commitment to sustainability, it's all done electronically and it's very easy to use. And come and find me if you need any help or pointers along the way. You will find all the details there. Um, now, in terms of when we have situations over the next couple of days when we have some Q&As going on on some of our panel discussions. They'll be moderated by either the speaker here or myself. Um, and all you need to do if you're here in the hall watching on, just raise your hand, we'll get a mic down to you, just introduce yourself and you can ask the question. That's the easiest way I think for everybody who's going to be in the hall over the next couple of days. But I am aware that there are lots of overseas uh, viewers for the next couple of days on these panel sessions who'll be watching because these sessions 
sessions are going to be streamed on YouTube. So if you are one of the overseas uh, viewers watching us, there is a Slido app. You can find all the details for that Slido app on the brochure with that QR code. Uh, again, get in touch if you're having any issues, but you can put your question in there, just introduce yourself, say who you are, and we will also get to some of the questions from the people watching overseas, because I understand it's a big commitment to coming over here, and we are very grateful for everybody who has so far, but we want to have the conversation opened up uh, to everybody around uh, the world who is watching. We have some panel discussions. We're also going to have a breakout session a little bit later this afternoon. That will be after lunch. I'll provide you with the details of that a little bit closer to the time. We're going to divide people up into five sessions and have some breakout sessions um, that we can all contribute to. Um, I'm aware that there could be some media here. Media are absolutely you know, great to be here and involved. Um, more than welcome to be here for all the panel and the, the Q&As that we're going to have. The breakout sessions are closed sessions, so they're going to be just closed off to the media, just so you're aware. Um, but I think that is it for the moment. As I said, I will be around for the next couple of days. Come find me. I'll prod and poke and I'll keep everything flowing as best as we can over the couple of days. But I am delighted uh, to kick us off, to welcome to the stage uh, for our opening address. I'm delighted to welcome Anton Ishta, a Minister for Foreign Affairs and Minister for Defence, Mr. Michal Martin. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, um, Sarah Agus M. Arish, Sean Fleming, Agus Ianne, Ureke Agus Dini Dinuishle Galair, Ano Hasarum Foilte Fila Ache Roiv Galair Got Hashlan Vale Ache Kliab Don Orum Kahaha Donda Ernache Shaw. Ishe Sean Triu Forum Dale Head Eglenun Teraig Uhashud Gavilas Kudiag Agus Gavilas Shachtiag. Minister Fleming. Uh, distinguished guests, um, good morning, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you here to Dublin Castle for this Global Irish Civic Forum. And thank you, um, Sarah, for your uh, lovely introduction, and wish you the very best uh, over the coming weeks and months as you cover, I understand, the all Ireland Championships uh, for the BBC, uh, and um, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to key in from time to time. Uh, I want to say that this is our third such forum following on from those in 2.15 and 2.17. Uh, and I'm pleased to be here with my colleague, Minister of State, Sean Fleming, who has specific responsibility for the diaspora, um, to in many ways engage with you over the coming while. Um, and um, the, 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 the theme of this forum is Lechele Arisht together um, again. Uh, obviously, uh, we're all conscious that there's been um, a delay in terms of convening this forum for obvious reasons. Um, in terms of what has transpired over the last number of years. But I do wanna, want to, in particular, remember those members um, that your organizations uh, and your communities lost uh, to the COVID um, pandemic. Uh, I also um, want to acknowledge uh, the manner uh, in which your organizations, and indeed you and your communities, responded uh, to the unprecedented challenges uh, that you all faced during that difficult period. And on my visits uh, to London and particularly to the United States in recent times, I've witnessed at first hand and heard at first hand uh, the degree uh, of response from your organizations, uh, which I think was uh, comprehensive and very effective. And I wanna thank you on my own behalf and on behalf of the Irish government and people for your untiring efforts in helping those members of your Irish communities who were most in need uh, during a very, very difficult period. And I also want to acknowledge the additional workload uh, of man, that many of you are still facing, um, supporting communities struggling with the cost of living crisis uh, and the pressures on staff and volunteers who've had to move from one crisis to another. From the government's perspective, it was important that through our COVID response fund for communities abroad, we were in a position to provide financial support uh, to aid your efforts. That our contribution could be allocated and distributed so quickly and effectively underline the value of our sustained investment in community organizations and networks over the past two decades. Your response did not surprise us, of course, with Irish communities all over the world, invariably and regularly rallying around in times of need. 
I recall from my previous tenure as Minister for Foreign Affairs how the members of the Irish diaspora from all over the world gladly offered their time, expertise and influence to help the national recovery effort in the wake of the 2008 global economic crisis. The establishment of the Global Irish Network and the convening of four meetings of the Global Irish Economic Forum showed just what the Irish diaspora is capable of. On a day-to-day -day basis, your organisations have long been important partners for the Department of Foreign Affairs and our diplomatic missions in their support in, for citizens in need of assistance. We deal with a high and sustained number of consular cases each year, including cases of arrest, imprisonment, missing persons, serious injury, mental health difficulty and death. And many of these cases are complex and they require significant ongoing engagement. And your support on the ground is hugely important and very highly valued by us. Nor have you been found wanting on the political front. We have, as you know, this week been marking the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. In Washington DC, London, Ottawa, Helsinki, Pretoria and across the world, we are acknowledging the international support that helped achieve the agreement, support that was in large part mobilized by and led by you, our Irish diaspora. And of course, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution agreed as part of the Good Friday Agreement explicitly acknowledges the diaspora. During his historic visit here last week, US President Joe Biden, himself a proud member of Ireland's diaspora, spoke of his deep and abiding affection um, for this island. And he spoke of the importance of the Good Friday Agreement, of how a whole generation has grown to adulthood out of the shadow of violence, and that Ireland's young people are writing a new future, a future of unlimited possibilities. And of course, he also wished Mayo uh, the very best in terms of its <laughs> ongoing quest um, for Sam Maguire, and he made me an honorary member of the Wee County in, in, in Loud. <laughs> However, just to say his visit was powerful, uh, and um, as I must say, having met the President on numerous occasions, he wears his Irishness on his sleeve, and he's been a tremendous support to us over the last year or two in particular during the Brexit, the aftermath of Brexit, uh, and intervening to safeguard uh, the Good Friday Agreement, uh, along with many friends that we have on the Hill. Uh, and we appreciated the, his intervention very much. And his homecoming last week was something that will long live in our memories um, and in our hearts. He, he enjoyed it um, immensely. But for all of you, I think he was speaking on all of your behalf in the context of that uh, Good Friday narrative and story. Uh, and I think to have helped, for you to have helped bring about a future uh, of unlimited possibilities, as the President has said, is a powerful legacy for Ireland and its diaspora to share. And in his remarks to the houses of the Oireachtas, the President also encourages us all to set our eyes squarely on the future. The next two days are an opportunity for us all to do just that and to think and reflect about the unlimited possibilities of the global Irish family. For our part as a government, we, we remain absolutely committed to su supporting and sustaining our diaspora and all our commitments in respect of our diaspora that we've made in the programme for government and to into the future and strengthening the relationship between Ireland and our diaspora. We look to you this week and every week to guide us on how best to do that. The most tangible expression of our support has been our emigrant support programme. And since its establishment in 2004, the programme has assisted over 530 organisations in some 37 countries with grants totalling over 220 million euros. Grants have ranged from small amounts for grassroots groups to major allocations awarded to voluntary and community organizations operating on a large scale. And the program will continue to provide significant funding to community, cultural, sporting, business, and other Irish community groups with care for the most vulnerable and marginalized Irish emigrants re remaining its primary um, focus. We have introduced changes to the program this year to streamline the process and to make it more straightforward. And we will continue to adapt it as needs be in the years ahead. And I'm sure that your discussions here this week will also look at the expanding horizons of what it means to be Irish. And in that regard, we look to previously underrepresented groups 
to those with no familial links, but a very strong affinity to Ireland and to all who see themselves as part of an inclusive and diverse global Irish family. Regardless of where our Irish ancestry or Irish connections comes from, each individual story of connection with Ireland is rich, complex, filled with light and shade. This complexity is a world story, a story of the Irish family all over the world. And we truly are all over the world. You can find place names like Belfast and Clonmel in Jamaica. Surnames like O'Farrell and O'Donoghue can be heard from the Andean region and in Mexico. Argentina is home to the largest Irish diaspora outside of the English-speaking world, as well as long-established hurling and Gaelic football clubs. Across Europe, the traces of the wild geese are to be found in Irish colleges in Spain, in Belgium, in vineyards in France, in military histories and stories of pilgrims such as St. Killian. Irish communities, old and new, as rich and as varied a nation as our history of emigration would suggest. We may not emigrate in the numbers we once did, and that is a good thing, but many do still leave these shores looking for adventure uh, and experience and also to share their expertise, enriching the pool of Irishness abroad as they go. And Irishness at home is being enriched by the inward migration into Ireland. Almost 18% 18% of the population of Ireland was born abroad. Ireland is a place that is now a far more open and diverse place, immeasurably enriched by what those what they add to our national story, those born abroad in our population. And it is imperative to maintaining the strong bond between our diaspora and our people at home that each reflects the other and each remains recognisable to the other and that it is very much and that is very much the case today. <coughs> and, that <laughs> in that regard, I want to thank your organisations, which are pursuing new streams of work linked to the priorities of the government's diaspora strategy 2020 to 2025, in particular work working with underrepresented groups. And in particular, I want to identify the area of mental health during my recent visits um, to New York and to Boston, uh, we were very struck uh, by the interventions of quite a number of organizations that we support within our diaspora in terms of reaching out uh, in the context of mental health challenges, particularly in the context of COVID-19 and in the aftermath uh, of COVID-19. Uh, and these are areas that we're anxious to explore further with you in terms of tailor-made programs um, and, and supporting uh, the type of initiatives that we witnessed um, on our recent um, visits. Irish people retain a fierce love for the home place, expressed in many different ways, whether through culture, business, education, and many other channels. For many Irish people living overseas, the GEA in particular continues to provide a connection to home and an Irish sporting and social outlet that they need uh, and indeed that they love. For Irish immigrants and their descendants, the Gaelic Athletic Association is a bridge to home and to their heritage. For others, it is a gateway to Ireland and to Irish culture. The Department of Foreign Affairs recognises the uniqueness of this, global Irish, this Irish global network, and we have since 2012 been operating a joint partnership with the Gaelic Athletic Association through the Global Games Development Fund. This initiative is now supporting over 100 projects worldwide and is an exemplar of what a global wealth service network can achieve. I'm delighted to see fellow Corkman and Gaelic Athletic Association's President Larry McCarthy here with us this morning and let me take this opportunity to wish Larry well and to thank you Larry. This is your final year of your very successful term as President of the Gaelic Athletic Association and we thank you for that. And I also want to wish your club, New York GA men's senior football team, uh, all the best as they take on Sligo in two days' time uh, in the Connacht semi-final, following on their recent historic win um, over Leitrim. Sorry about that, Sharon, uh, in respect of Leitrim. Now, I must say, Larry, be careful, because if anybody was listening to Morning Ireland this morning, uh, an excerpt from Ocean FM, Sligo, for the first time ever, retained 
their Connacht title under 20. First time they've ever retained uh, a championship two years in a row. So New York have Sligo with momentum coming forward. And what's interesting is that more than half of the New York panel that beat Leitrim uh, were US born, uh, which on the one hand I think is a vindication of the Gaelic Athletic Association's great work in promoting the games globally and keeping the connection to Ireland alive. But it is also indicative on the other hand of changing immigration patterns, a topic I'm sure will get plenty of airing um, over the next two days. And indeed in France recently, in Breton and Brittany area, local schools are now teaching um, Gaelic games uh, uh, and in terms of that Celtic connection and synergy uh, be between France uh, and Ireland and that part, part of France and Ireland. And as immigration patterns change po and populations age, diaspora communities evolve, as do our relationships and our engagements with them. And the cornerstone of our engagement is our diaspora strategy 2020 to 2025. We are now at the midway point of that five-year strategy and your discussions and deliberations here over the next two days will feed into our ongoing assessment and recalibration of our strategic approach. What are we doing right? What is not working so well? Are there things we should be doing that we are not doing? The previous iterations of this forum in 2015 and 2017 have been of immeasurable help to us in guiding our diaspora engagement and diaspora policy development. I'm sure that this one will be of similar value to us. And I'm particularly pleased that we have with us today a number of government representatives from countries which are interested in hearing about Ireland's diaspora engagement and what Irish community organisations are doing on the ground. You are very welcome in particular, and I hope that you will see something over the next two days that will give you some ideas for your own diaspora um, engagement. I'm pleased also that we have representatives of a number of our own local authorities here today conscious of how important the local aspect of diaspora engagement is and how active a number of them are in this area. And that, that's always very evident in Patrick's week in terms of the number of local authorities that travel overseas to connect uh, with their uh, immediate diaspora, so to speak, in terms of that local um, context. Uh, there are many issues uh, that I haven't covered uh, today in, in, in my uh, contribution, but we hope to uh, engage in further detail over the next two days uh, with you on and we want a productive uh, and fruitful conversation with you um, with outputs um, this is your forum we want to hear from you thank you very much for your attendance uh, and may you enjoy the next number of days <laughs> Wonderful stuff. Uh, thank you very much, Anton. I'm delighted to uh, welcome to the stage right now. We have him down there ready to go. We have the Minister of State for International uh, Development and Diaspora, Mr. Sean Fleming. And we're going to have a quick chat with uh, Sean about his work so far, and then we will progress on to our first panel. wonderful audience, Sean. Now, this yeah. is nice, isn't it? Delighted to be here. Yeah, well, wonderful to have you with us. So, um, it's only been a few months, hasn't it, uh, yeah. since you've been involved, particularly in the diaspora side of things. So, so how have those few months been? What have you learned? Okay, just before I answer that, I just want to give apologies for the Tanishta who has to return to the Dáil immediately because he's dealing with uh, order of business and leaders questions in the Dáil today. He just got down from Hillsborough in the early hours of this morning. So it is great to have him here, but the dog uh, he has to go to now. So I do give his apologies for his early departure. Now, <clears throat> you mentioned, um, I'm new in the job since just before Christmas, and everybody will know there was a change in, um, at government level. The Taoiseach and the Taunish to swap places as agreed um, halfway through the lifetime of this government. And as a result of that, there were a few, three or four consequential changes. I had been in the Department of Finance uh, Michael McGrath has taken over that position, so it was always agreed from day one that we would swap positions, and I'm very pleased to be in the Department of Foreign Affairs with the Taoiseach and my own party leader. So it's a be, been a big learning curve for me, 
which is an area I hadn't a particular involvement in before. Everybody knows about the Irish diaspora and how many people we have overseas. And most of us in Ireland think about all the people who went to uh, the UK a generation ago. And um, during Patrick's Day visits last year, I visited four or five Irish centres over there. And they're mainly an ageing population. And, you know, they regularly get back to Ireland. Some of them don't have that opportunity. And some of them, in their old age, want to return home because maybe they have no family members out there. That's the traditional view. When I grew up uh, in County Leash, uh, every August weekend and for the first two weeks of August, the population <laughs> of the village doubled when everybody came home from England and they had plenty of cash and they enjoyed themselves and then they went back, but maybe they weren't all as well off when they got back home. So that's the picture we understood. <laughs> and we always helped. I think the key element of our immigrant support is to help that type of a community. But I think everybody knows um, the population changes in Ireland. Irish people now are going much further afield for education. They're much better educated since free education came in the 1960s and they're taking up better positions, better jobs in every country in the world. And I think what we have seen now is the pattern of emigration changing in that years ago when people left, there was a good chance that they can come home. Whereas now many people go for a number of years and come back, but many of them meet friends out there and get settled down and get married and rear families and don't come home. So there are some of the changes I've seen and noticed very obviously mm -hmm. uh, since I took over the role. So um, it's a big learning experience for myself. And I know when we were chatting briefly, you were mentioning some of the visits that you've been on uh, around the world, even in the, the last few months. It's yeah. some really fascinating So places. it is really interesting. My first role there in January is to accompany um, and took her on uh, Michael E. Higgins to Senegal. And we met one or two people out there who were with Irish roots. But more interestingly then, um, <clears throat> just before Easter, I visited uh, Malawi and Zambia. And it's surprising you meet people, uh, Irish people, everywhere you go. And Patrick's Day was in Brazil, and I was in Sao Paulo, um, Brasilia, and Rio de Janeiro, two days in each place. But um, the first call I made when I arrived in Sao Paulo was of Sunday morning, and I called to, uh, and really they're, they're the unsung heroes of the Irish diaspora over the previous generation, is the, the Irish religious priests and nuns. They're everywhere around the world held in high esteem in those countries. They're again an aging population, but I walked in to meet a few, four or five Irish priests on a Sunday afternoon after they said their masses and they're in their 70s and 80s and went into room to meet them. And there, one guy was proudly wearing his Galway jersey. Good and they're just watching, <laughs> uh, just after watching uh, GA go on the television and they weren't missing a single match. So yeah. they're totally tuned in. So it was fantastic to see that. So their hearts were still in Ireland, even though they were yeah. overseas. So there are some examples of... And then when I was in Zambia, um, I met a number of Irish business people who left here in the 70s and later, and now are running food companies, supplying to the supermarket, buying products out there. So we have Irish people in business in some of those countries, not to mention uh, people I met you know, when I was in the UK as well. Yeah. So in those areas, there, lots of them are actually now settled and running mm. very profitable businesses and helping the economies where they live out there. Yeah, it's broad and vast and it's changing, isn't it? Um, for this forum then, for you, Minister, w w what do you think it n needs to achieve? Okay, the first thing is, it's your forum. It's not our forum. I'm off the stage in a few minutes and it's over to you then for the next two days and you've heard all the politicians that are going to speak out of the way, as we'll call it, early on. But what we need to do is, especially after COVID, we were locked down, the world was locked down, and I think we need to open up again and meet our people again. And together again is the theme of this conference. It's been five years or six years since we've had it, so it is overdue. We would have loved to have done it before now, but the new government was very, very keen, as soon as was practicable to do so, to have the conference, to meet all yourselves, because we do have a str strategy for the diaspora for 20 to 25, and we're you know, just over the halfway period. And we want you to do a checklist with us over the coming days. What have we done? Are we meeting our targets? Have we said what? Uh, are we delivering on what we spoke about? And more importantly, uh, it's always good to get an input. Is there something not in that strategy that we need to take on board for the future as well? 
So I think the changing patterns of immigration, there will be different views than the traditional views we would have in previous decades. So if we're a little bit behind the times with our strategy, please tell us so we can work it into our plans into the future as well. Mm. And for everybody at the moment, I, I mean, everybody's involved in this, so they may per perhaps know, but just set out how Ireland supports its diaspora at the moment. Well, the immigrant support um, programme is the principal thing that we do um, uh, through the Department of Foreign Affairs. And it's a situation where we give grants to diaspora organisations all over the world. And most of them would go to the UK and the USA, and then the rest, about a third to the other countries as well. But primarily our support would be in, in the UK where they're older people and not as young and as active and earning a, a, an income to the level that they would have. And they need more support and they need a place to gather and feel um, they're, they're all one. And what's very interesting, and many of you will have visited those centres, the county loyalty is <laughs> all about, all you have to ask is, uh, you know, what county are you from? And they're <laughs> off <laughs> straight away. And there's not a county in Ireland that you won't meet somebody from out there and they never lose, they're not just Irish, they're from Cork or they're from Kerry or there's a few of them from Leash or wherever, their county comes first and as I mentioned even in, Re in Sao Paulo they're wearing their county jerseys at these events and it's fantastic to see <coughs> the crack between the counties, you know, even at amongst people who've left Ireland 40 years ago. I know, it never leaves you, does it? No, that's it never our, leaves yeah, you. it's our sense of identity. Absolutely, yeah. Um, what do you think the main challenges are then for Ireland? You mentioned, you know, the fact that it's an evolving and a changing diaspora now, you know, um, from earlier generations who maybe went, you know, 50s, 60s to, to young kids now either going to college or, or working. You know, it's, it's hard to kind of manage all the various facets. Yeah, and that's the area I think we need to concentrate on now because the people are leaving are more educated, generally more independent, you know, they don't rely on a formal structure that they might have had in the UK and the USA. And one organization, we, I, I think we all have technology, and I'm not, there are other organizations do equally good work as well. But the GA is great. I know um, when anybody leaves Ireland, the first thing they'll find out is there a GA club. Because they go there, some of them may not be players. Some of them might have played. Some of them never will play. But they feel there's a network there. And it forms a great basis of making them feel at home and when they arrive there, they have a community, and generally of their own age, and they also have a, a benefit as well. If some of them um, run into an issue that needs to be dealt with, there may be a more experienced person already in that community out there to help them along the line, instead of having to phone us directly in foreign affairs. So you've actually, these groups have reduced our workload a little <laughs> bit. All the problems don't come straight back to Dublin. Yes, the big ones do, but individual local issues, can be dealt with locally by people with experience locally. But <clears throat> the challenge we have is to link in and communicate with those through, be it social media or internet, because they might see themselves coming back and they might not come back. And there's so many people on the move as well. They don't just go and settle in a place. And there's different categories of populations going. It could be teachers or nursing staff or construction workers. And as to get a network amongst themselves and the suggestion I would make is that you pick the areas to where they have an interest in. Be it construction, if we focus on that, you'll get people in that area, in the, in the construction industry who have uh, an interest in Ireland, or they might be members of the diaspora directly, and similarly, whether it's teaching or nursing or some other profession, rather than just Irish on its own. <clears throat> because most people know their sense of identity, but it's what to do in their daily lives is what's interested them what interests them, and that I think we need to make contact with them through what they're interested in, not only because they're Irish. So that, that's a new challenge, mm. that's a new challenge. And I know we may be biased because we're, you know, a lot of us have this deep connection to Ireland, but there does seem, whenever I've traveled around the world for work or, or just on holidays, there's a deep sense of connection and um, a great shared fondness, and even people not from Ireland connect with Irish people, and there's a great strength to be had to be associated with being Ireland. I mean, you must find that even now within these last four months, there's a great positivity and power. To there it. is, and maybe I'm speaking, um, just this is a personal observation, I've detected a few reasons for that. The people like our Irish, one, we were never at war with anybody, and that does count. Mm -hmm. You know, we never took sides against any nation in the world. We've been neutral and never been uh, involved in sending armies abroad. 
what I will say, what stands to Ireland, especially in Africa countries and other areas, uh, we, um, 60 years ago this year, we started sending peacekeeping forces abroad to keep the peace after the war was over so it won't reoccur. And for the last 60 years, there's not been one single day that there hasn't been a member of the Irish Defence Forces abroad on a peacekeeping mission. And people get that. They see we're the peacekeepers rather than the war makers. We never colonised any of these countries, which other countries did. So I, there's a lot of affinity, mm. I think, to Ireland um, from all those points of view. And I don't, you'll never meet anybody that is against the Irish people. Yeah, you know, so I think that's really important. And what I've just mentioned, even our peacekeeping forces, doesn't come into this conversation, but it does stand as well under the United Nations flag and so many Irish people out there. And that, that message does travel in its own right. Well, wonderful stuff. We appreciate your time this morning, Minister. Thank you for stopping by and having the conversation. And I say thank you to you, Sarah. And especially, I want to thank you all for coming. We have a fantastic turnout here today. The hall is full. After COVID, it's always hard to predict how many will come. So we're really pleased to hear uh, your views today, not just in the plenary sessions, but in the smaller breakout session. Please say everything you have to say in those sessions, because we want to get the positive feedback. We have our own views in the department, and that's fine. But your views are far more important. And we're here not to lead the conversation, but to listen and take on board uh, you know, for the next couple of years in our strategy. So I, I say thank you all for coming and enjoy the day and a productive day. And I thank you, Sarah, and best of luck to you. Okay? Ah, thank you very much. Wonderful stuff. Thank you very much to the Minister there, uh, Sean Fleming. Now, I'm delighted to introduce our first panel session this morning. Uh, this one is going to be on one of the themes, our people. It's responding to the needs of and staying relevant to an evolving diaspora. So touching on some of the uh, thoughts there and contributions from uh, the Minister. This uh, panel is going to be moderated by Mr. Kieran Madden, Political Director of the Ireland United Kingdom and America's Division at the Department of Foreign Affairs. So I will welcome panel number one to the stage then for the moment and we will get started uh, with that one. I'm Gillian Goulding from Arhala, County Cork. The Irish Canadian Immigration Centre is a national organisation serving new arrivals from across the island of Ireland. We help with questions about immigration, employment and social services. We assist over 10,000 people a year. ICANN is Canada wide. We have staff in Toronto and Vancouver. I work out of Vancouver, British Columbia. We cover six time zones across Canada. We use webinars, social media, podcasts and video to reach the Irish diaspora across the second biggest country in the world. For example, our social media campaigns promote mental health and well-being and addiction awareness. And we also highlight challenges faced by many new arrivals. These include housing, employment, immigration status, financial literacy and information for families. We also offer free webinars on employment and career resources and work permits and residency. I am the National Social Care Advisor. I help our clients to find general health, mental health and wellbeing services in their communities. I also run a weekly newcomer seminar in Vancouver, which provides information and resources about setting up in their new city. If you're going to Toronto, we have one in that city too. I love my job. Um, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here among you as to echo what the Taunashta and Minister Fleming said. It is fantastic to have you back here after such a break. Um, I was lucky enough to have participated in the previous two versions of this forum, as I know so many of you uh, did. And I know that so much of the value in this is in the conversations over coffee, over lunch, in the corridors, maybe later this evening over a pint. It's also in the conversations that we start here that you will continue among yourselves within, within your own 
localities and across, across countries and across regions in the months ahead. But hopefully these panel discussions will give some food for thought. We're not going to reach big answers to every question here, but hopefully we give you the right quest questions to take away for the days and months ahead. Um, the topic for this morning's panel, it's, it's not up there, you have it in your, in your programme that Sarah directed you to via the QR code, is responding to the needs of and staying relevant to an evolving diaspora. Now that is very broad and can go in any number of directions, including some that are covered by other panels. Uh, we'll have some Q&A up here first, and then we will go to the floor. But our panelists here this morning are exceptionally well qualified to speak to that question of evolution because they come from some of our more, our, our, probably our four largest and longest established diaspora communities, communities where there are organizations that have been in place for centuries, sorry, sorry communities in place for centuries, organizations in place for decades. But those communities are being renewed by new arrivals who arrive in different ways. And that presents its own challenges. So I'm sure you have their bios there via that QR code, but I will do a quick introduction if you'll bear with me. We have Cathy Murphy, who was the executive director of the Canadian, Irish Canadian Immigration Centre. You saw the video up here, the, adverti the advertisement has been done. She's also the vice president of the EU Chamber of Commerce, Canada. And she has, in her own words, made a career in Ireland-Canada relations. Ne next to Cathy, you have Alan Humphreys. Alan has a day job working as a senior executive in retail in Australia. He's also from Cork, which puts about a slightly higher plane to our other panelists. <laughs> but a few years ago, he started volunteering in fundraising for the Irish Support Agency of New South Wales. And just December just gone, he was made president of, of the board of that organization. Brian Dalton, right next to me here, is the CEO of Irish in Britain, an umbrella organization for more than 130 Irish community organisations across Britain. He's been in that role since 2017, but has been working in the sector, was working in the sector for 30 years prior to that. So a huge experience and a huge um, breadth of, of vision across what is happening in the diaspora in Britain. And Hilary Byrne is the founder and uh, chairman of the New York, New York City St. Patrick's Day Foundation. He is also the person who runs the uh, world's oldest and world's largest St. Patrick's Day Parade, New York City St. Patrick's Day Parade, where you have probably anything north of 150,000 men and women marching up uh, Fifth Avenue on St. Patrick's Day every year. He's also a board member of votingrights.ie and is active in the US-based ad hoc committee to protect the Good Friday Agreement. I'll put one uh, broad question to you to here to get, get the ball rolling. Minister Fleming mentioned the challenge of finding new ways of connecting. As I said, each of your communities have these long established organizations and you have new arrivals. Some of those arrivals come in, in very different circumstances, as the minister said, to those who, the generations who went before them. New arrivals can bring energy and ideas, but sometimes, and I've seen this firsthand, new arrivals who come straight from Ireland can look with a little bit of skepticism at some of those things that have gone before and say, well, we're a bit different to those ones or the organizations don't reflect what we're doing. So could I ask each of you how the old and the new sit side by side within your communities? And what I would love to hear is good examples of how that intergenerational engagement works, because I know that research that was done by Professor Liam Kennedy, who was out there somewhere in the blackness a few years ago in some US cities, pointed to big gaps in intergenerational connections. So if I can, I might start with you, Hilary. I'll put you on the spot early on. <laughs> yes. Oh, well. Uh the parade in New York is always a very much a, a unifying event for all ages, uh, from all counties. Uh, to, um, everybody comes together on St. Patrick's Day. Um, but in recent years, like I, I lived there 33 years uh, since I left Ireland, and in recent years, uh, the diaspora is changing. It's a highly educated diaspora. Um, it's not as involved in the, in the traditional organizations. And you mentioned Professor Liam Kennedy in a recent piece that he mentioned, um, the diaspora, uh, the first and second generations in the United States, 85% of the, of the younger generation between 18 and 30 years of age are not part of any Irish organization. Um, yet in 2019, two million uh, people came from North America to Ireland on holidays. Um, and that's an issue. Um, 
there needs to be a better job in engaging the second and third generation in the United States in particular. Um, why? Because Ireland has benefit tremendously from its ancestral diaspora in the United States. For example, the Good Friday Agreement, um, the, the President's visited recently, and there has been, uh, in 1914, um, New York Irish gave the equivalent of 3.7 million to support the volunteers and so on and so forth. But down through the years, that and in recent years, because of an aging Irish-American population, uh, that connection is starting to waver. And in 10, 15 years, unless there's some major engagement with particularly the younger generation and a more real engagement here from Ireland with the diaspora, especially nationals like myself, uh, in some form of engagement with either voting rights in a presidential election or some kind of representation here, um, the, it, the ability of Ireland to have access to the White House on its national holiday may disappear. So there needs to be some real engagement, in particular the first and second and third generations. Because like I say, 85% of the young generation are not involved in any type of Irish organization. They love the culture. Um, River Dance was the best thing that Ireland ever put out there. And they love the culture but they need to be engaged, and there's a, a, a gap, a huge gap in the United States. And I see it even with the organizations in the parade. Their, their participation, number-wise, are starting to wane, uh, and they need support as well in that area. Okay, Th thanks, Harry. I would, there's so much to dive into on that, yeah, but I won't. I will give everyone else their, their speak <laughs> first. Alan, I might move on to you. Um, yeah, so I, I guess from a, an Australia perspective, and particularly from Sydney, we do see um, a bit of a change. You've got two main groups, really. You've got the, the working holiday visa people who come in their droves, and we had mass exodus when COVID came in the, in the very early days and weeks. Um, and, but we're seeing that return to normal now in terms of the numbers that are coming over. Again, similar to Hillary, it's a very skilled, um, educated workforce that are coming today. Um, and generally, they kind of, you know, they're very, very involved with the GAA, or they're going to work for companies or people that they know that have been very successful of Irish heritage in Australia. So they find themselves within that, that community um, and in those networks looking after themselves quite well at a, at, at, to a certain point and at an age. Um, and then on the other end of the scale, we have people who came in the 1930s, the late 30s, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and they're what we would call more of our senior um, cohorts now at the moment. Um, and they're similar to maybe um, some of the, I suppose, more life skills or um, the labor workforces that came of their generation and helped to build you know, the cities of Australia, um, which would have been a tough life. But they're now going into that advancing age where they're looking for a lot more support in terms of accessing social services, assistant house, assisted housing, assistance with healthcare, et cetera. Um, where do the two groups collide? I think distance is a huge thing. Obviously, Australia, on a, a good day, I had a bad experience getting here, but on a good day, it takes 27 and a half hours to get up. Um, but that, I think, really is encouraging for some of that younger cohort that do settle and stay in Australia. They miss that connection to the, the grandparents, the aunties, the uncles, and um, that sense of community. So that's where they link between ourselves in a befriending type service and actually connecting with the seniors in our group. So we do have um, IT programs that we run for the seniors, and that was you know invaluable when we went into the, the COVID pandemic. Um, and we've got this group of a younger generation that are you know connecting with that older generation out of that sense of community and sense of connectivity. But similar to Hillary, that, that, that group, they're very self-sufficient and they're, they're making a community for themselves down there and they're quite comfortable. It's that connection back to Ireland for those that stay is probably, is lacking. Um, it's always small groups and communities that will have that grow for the, the Irish language and the grow for music and traditional culture that is very, very strong within the Irish community in Australia. But it is, there is a, a growing group that that's of less importance and, and less interest and I guess that's to do with the urbanization of Ireland in itself in terms of people moving from the country to the big cities um, and certain amount of erosion of that I suppose culture is happening here 
Um, and if it's happening here, it's happening tenfold overseas, which it, it's a real shame. But I think that's where we see both of our, I suppose, cohorts and communities coming together. Um, and their changing needs are today, the, that younger generation, more skilled, more independent, and more connected. Um, whereas with the, the older cohort, if you think of any of your, your neighborhood communities at home or where you grew up, there is that senior element that the community needs to look after. Um, and, and again, they don't necessarily have the family networks either. They're not all retired pensioners with you know a dozen grandchildren. A lot of the seniors that we have within the Irish community are actually on their own, and they've had quite tough and challenged lives. Um, and we in the Irish Support Agency were, uh, I likened it to, to somebody last night, that we're almost like the community centre. So we do everything from um, the new arrivals to un the unfortunate repatriations of, of people who had you know, long and successful or difficult lives in Australia back to, back to their homeland and back to Ireland. So it's a, it's a very, very unique, um, I think, um, it's a very, very unique uh, diaspora community, uh, and I think that is driven by by distance and um, some of our communities' ability to come back to Ireland. Is, it just it simply doesn't exist um, to come back here to, to Ireland on a regular basis by any means. Distance is a huge factor, obviously, and as you say, the changing nature of Irish society is mirrored in some way or carried over when they get there. Um, Cathy McGuinty, you next. Certainly. Um, so our newest arrivals in Canada, post-pandemic arrivals now, are so um, connected digitally and so independent because of that, uh, that we don't see them reaching out in the same way that new arrivals did, let's say, 12 years ago. Um, and it's a good thing because they're in, they're in contact with people back in Ireland. They can do their Zoom calls. They can do their team calls with their families. But the pandemic really exposed a vulnerability there. Um, because it, it did reveal that that digital connectivity, while it's very, very significant, it's not enough. Um, so those who stayed in Canada during the pandemic, who didn't have family in Canada, and, and, and they were indeed tethered to Ireland by, through their phones, um, still needed this, this face-to-face -face piece. So that's certainly something that I see our communities across Canada now starting to look at. How can they draw the newer young people uh, into community uh, to make sure when these crises happen that they're not just turning to their phones. Um, so one way that we see this happening is with our uh, Irish chambers of commerce across the country. The new arrivals are definitely dialed into those communities because they need the professional networks uh, and they need those networking opportunities from sector to sector. So we do see that face-to-face -face engagement happening there with the older and the new. Um, and then in the Vancouver in particular, we're really starting to see an intergenerational connectivity starting to happen, and that definitely came out of COVID. It also um, came out of the new a consulate that is, has established itself in Vancouver over the last five years um, that has been very successful in drawing the young people into community events where they're meeting uh, the older, more established members of the community. And all of a sudden, we're, we're seeing a massive shift in, in the way young people want to engage when they come to Canada. You know, so many who are coming, they, they, they come with a mentality that I think is really important to being successful in their careers. They, they, they're Irish, they're proud to be Irish. Some of them have come with uh, Irish friends who are their roommates. Um, they want to maintain that connection to Ireland, but they recognize very much that they're in Canada and they want to have a Canadian experience. They want to meet Canadian friends and they want to meet uh, other immigrants. Um, which is something we could also talk about later, that, that term immigrant isn't something that I really hear our young people using, but when you get to Canada, you are. Um, so they have that wonderful sort of, sort of professional focus on I'm in Canada now, um, but if they run into crisis, like the pandemic, if they run into a mental health crisis, we see them slowly starting to turn back to community, and we need to find a way, I think, to help them to evolve that process. Without giving them more crises, hopefully. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm very taken by the idea that 12 years is enough of a generation shift for that different way of communicating and engaging. It makes me feel very old. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, if we might go with your side, I mean, we'll dig into some of these themes then. Sure, Karen. Um, well, we have just conducted a large piece of research on the 2021 census um, in Britain. And of course, what the story tells us, of course, is there's been huge social and demographic changes in Britain. Uh, and particularly amongst the Irish community. It is diverse, it is plural, it is evolving. Um, and it looks uh, very different uh, than it did 25 years ago. Um, 
And I think it's also worth considering what we consider new in the context of this conversation, Kieran, because we're also very mindful that there is a few hundred thousand new Irish passport holders um, newly minted uh, in Britain. And what is our conversation with them in terms of engagement? Where do they sit uh, in that conversation? And I think that's something for us to consider. Um, in terms of young people coming over, I think uh, you mentioned at the start, Kieran, about um, maybe some of this group don't view themselves the same as some of our uh, more experienced um, and more established community representatives. But I suppose we shouldn't underestimate the psychic burden of leaving Ireland and coming to another country. The people we speak to still feel experiences of loneliness and missing home. I mean, they're universal feelings. Um, I think it's the responsibility of organizations like us to develop the networks to meet that need. Um, our experience is that since Brexit, and I suppose it's inevitable that we don't have to, but I felt I had to, um, it has been a very difficult political environment in Britain over the last six years. There, in our view, that has mobilized people's appetite for representation within organizations like Irish in Britain um, at a time when Irish rights um, uh, and entitlements were under question. So I think people have, um, their, their sense of organization has been awoken. And I think there's an appetite for organization. Secondly, I think the pandemic, if there's one good thing that came out of it, was the profiling of community organizations, certainly in Britain, and I think it raised a new awareness amongst the Irish taxpayer about where their ESP bucks are going and the impact that it has. Um, and I think that's been hugely positive. So um, if one thing came out of it, I think there's a new awareness about the work of community organizations and what they do. And I suppose lastly, um, I just kind of want to say that um, if you can build the roots and the architecture to engage young people, um, and think about it laterally, I think you can be successful. We've, we launched a new leaders program three years ago, and we've trained up uh, over 40 trustees, young Irish people, um, into uh, the skills and experiences needed to be a trustees and community organizations. Um, and there's a huge appetite for that. And I think that's been a result of the ambition to get involved, um, but also an awareness of the value of community organizations and we're mindful that many of these young Irish people will be here for maybe three, four, five years. But that shouldn't preclude them opportunities to get involved and make a contribution. And we've got to, our treasure came through that route and many of our member organizations now have trustees who came through that route. So there is an appetite um, and I think it's, it's something we can develop. Okay, well you, you mentioned the ESP books there and I mean, Mr. Femian gave a good description of the, the, the Immigrant Support Programme and how it works. One thing I'll mention just as an observer of this over the years is, it, yes, there's more awareness of it now, but it's one of those pieces of public expenditure that never, that's never under political pressure because politicians of all hues are always so ready. They're, they're conscious of the pressure. It's psychic, the psychic disjunction that you mentioned, they're all conscious of the pressures that are on immigrant communities, diaspora communities. So there's always huge uh, support for that expenditure. But again, going back to the old versus new point, you have the diaspora strategy there, 2025. Every time a strategy like this is produced, or maybe strategies for your own organizations or your own communities, there's always a rush to the new. What can we do now that's exciting? And there's, a, you know, newness is exciting. What's there before can be taken as read. The Immigrant Support Program itself, I suppose its origins were in supporting welfare organizations in Britain through the Dion Fund, the Dion Committee. In each of your areas or for your wider experience, is there a risk that the rush to the new can displace the fundamentally good that is there? Does it put pressure on resources for uh, things that are needed, in particular welfare, which both you, Brian, and Alan mentioned in your, in your respective communities? I might go with Alan first. You, you were the first to bring it up. Um, I guess for us, some, sometimes, I mean, to your point, the rush for the new, I think. Um, on reflection, when 
when you mentioned immigration to people coming to Canada and they're setting up their careers and they're getting well involved in setting up and established and wanting to prove themselves successful and they want to show back to Ireland that they've been successful as well. That, I suppose, really is a community that we're trying to engage. So we are looking at new ways of how we can attract and engage and be relevant with them. Because what we find is once they've established that career or built that family, that's then when they're looking back to the Irish community. And um, so you kind of, you lose them in the early 20s to the, to the late 20s, maybe early 30s. Once they've got a family unit set up and they've settled and bought a house, then they kind of start to feel that need to connect back to the community again. And that's when they interact with us. So you lose them for, for a good 10 years. And we try and I suppose look at um, how do we in engage back with them to that community. Um, there's been a few things that have been quite simple. I mean, in terms of when we, the work that we do with the, um, the Irish community now and, and certainly some of the funding in, from the Immigrant Support Programme is how do we manage the mental health of people that come through the Irish Support Agency? So rather than pick them up and sort out their immediate need of, you know, whether it's a financial situation, if it's domestic violence or if it's an addiction issue, we, we don't just treat the spot wound, if you like. We actually look at it and put them through what we've got as a solace is the name of the mental health program that we work uh, with um, culturally sensitive counsellors that allow to pick those people back up and actually put them back on their feet. So it's as much about getting our message out there that we're not the welfare bureau anymore. We're more that end-to-end -end service. And the challenge we have as well is we don't necessarily find these people until they find us. And that's generally when they're in a situation of distress <coughs> or vulnerability. Um, and we'd like to be a bit more community um, and the softer side of things and ha have some fun. Um, and build up awareness that way versus kind of people find us when they when they need us the most, which which is amazing we're there and it's awesome that we're there. But I think we'd like to try and engage with that community. We're just not sure how to grab them um, at this stage, at that, that early intervention period. Yeah, there is a thing I'd say, when I know so many people here across the states, across Britain, that I would know in, in this room who work on that welfare piece. But of course, as you say, they only, they only come, you, only, you only know they're in need when they come to you. Yeah. You can't get out there and be anticipating. But then what you were describing, Brian, the, the programme of creating trustees for smaller organisations, you're actually giving them opportunity rather than just addressing need and maybe yeah. in so doing. But do you find that displacement, is there a displacement in the rush? Well, I think it's worth acknowledging that there is huge pressure on the welfare network in Britain because you know, underfunding of statutory services, complex need, entrenched need. So there's a big ask of community welfare and advice services now um, in a way that there probably hasn't been before. And they're, you know, they will gallantly address that challenge, but it puts a lot of pressure on them. Um, I, I think there's an opportunity to discuss and consider what is the future of the ESP program as the community evolves. Um, I think we can make a strong case for, it's a global budget, I understand, it's about 13 million, 14 million. It delivers a lot of value. Um, as a program of investment, um, and, it, and it has huge potential because this is a mature network, skilled organizations who know what they're doing, know their people, know the, the best of the voluntary sector, um, and a huge resource. And I think there is an opportunity to evolve the culture of the ESP grant from grant giver to grant receiver and more of a partnership model engages talk with us, um, they are experts and they know their local community so, so, so well. So I think as programs go, it's probably one of the most effective uh, the government has invested in. Um, and I think there's huge opportunities there. Can do better. We can have more. We can always have more. There's, look, there are plenty of takers out there for much more money. But. <laughs> Cathy, I know you have views on the old and the new. Yes, um, so the old, the old way of engaging with our diaspora, I think, is the, the high touch. So the community organizations like the GAA, like the various Irish cultural societies right across Canada, um, very successful on that soft place to land. And, and no, we shouldn't throw that away, and we absolutely need it. On the other hand, the new, for the last decade, has really been the high tech. So you've got the high touch, you've got the high tech. And we need to meet the diaspora, the young diaspora that we're dealing with, exactly where they are. And, and that is 
on digital and social channels. And I think the only way to signpost them and introduce them to those organizations, with the exception of the GAA that is so well known, uh, but to the other organizations that can give them that, that, that high touch in a crisis, the only way to do that is to engage with them in the digital sphere, to get them hooked in that way, um, to get them to understand how we can support them, and also to recognize, again, with the changing and evolving needs of the diaspora, you know, not everybody wants that cup of tea. There's definitely the new arrival who needs it and wants it. I had a lovely young gentleman in my office last week, and that is exactly what he needed. But I would say the majority coming are not looking for that. Uh, they don't actually want that. Uh, they want introductions to the professional networks. They want to understand um, how they can impact uh, their communities in Canada. And that's not, like I said, it's not always just an Irish community. So I think we need both. We need that balance. Um, but understanding the diaspora as they're coming out today, I think, is critical. And, and meeting those, them on those channels. I think that's where we'll have impact and success. I might frame the question a bit differently to you, Hilary. Just please answer the other question also. Yep. But St. Patrick's Day Parade, it's this huge thing. It has to be seen to be believed. And I went there thinking, you know, it's a very somber event in some ways. People march in serried rows. But when there is nearly 200,000 of them marching, it has this fabulous impact that gets you in the gut. Everyone in this room who's, who's Irish, to greater and lesser degrees, it will get, will get you in the gut. Should it modernise? We've seen parades here. Other, other ethnic parades in New York have this kind of float approach. That's the way parades have been here for a couple of decades in, in Dublin and, and across the country. I, I don't know the answer. Well, traditions are alive and well in the parade. To the traditions of the parade stretching back to 1762, 14 years before the Declaration of Independence, are still alive and well in that parade. When you have a parade of that magnitude, um, one of the issues that you could have, potentially, which we do not, is law and order. And those traditions has helped us to maintain that. Um, when it comes to disobedience, we have zero arrests in what is considered the world's largest parade. And when you look around at other parades, you, you find significant law and order issues. Um, and when um, we held our 250th parade, at the end of the parade, I said to all the volunteers, well, after 250 years, we finally got it right. <laughs> um, people come to New York with the expectation that there's a certain um, ethos, tradition, and they actually, they respect it. And in my 30 years of working at the parade, I happened to arrive in New York in the beginning of March 8th, 1988, and two weeks later I was working the reviewing stand. And in all those years, I have never seen anybody being disrespectful uh, in following the traditions of the parade. But when it comes to the other question that you were asking, the, uh, the engagement of the old and the new, the old engagement in New York was with all the county and the fraternal organizations. And they really went to bat to get people jobs, to get set up. And those organizations, are memberships are in decline. Um, they, um, the new, new immigrants come, they're educated. Um, and those who have difficulty getting jobs uh, go to places like the Irish Ashland Centre or the Emerald Isle Immigration Centre or the, the Irish Centre in Queens um, to assist them in getting um, established and to get jobs. And uh, all of those organisations, they, they give psychological services and help them in their times of needs uh, for the elderly. Um, they, some of them do Meals on Wheels uh, to make sure that the elderly are also brought in for regular uh, community meetings, so there's an engagement at, in, the, in the community centers. But again, that all requires money. Uh, the Ashland Center just uh, bought a building, uh, I think it was uh, somewhere in the region of 1.5 million that they had to put in. And the, they really went out and did a tremendous job, and people from the community donated hundreds of thousands in their labor and had their workers come in to support that. Um, so. In relation to the parade, we have modernized the parade. Uh, one of my jobs uh, when I went into the parade was, was no website, we now have a website. 
uh, I negotiated with NBC the, for live stream of the parade. I think we're on our 15th year. We were one of the first organizations to live stream an event. Uh, and, and today, uh, roughly somewhere in the region of about 2 million people watch us live stream. Buy ads, he sells ads. Yeah. Get, get good yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in, it, during COVID, um, we had an unannounced symbolic march with the parade, with the mayor, should I say. And we had a quarter of a million people and 40% of the people who watched an unannounced live stream symbolic parade for Fermanagh because in 2021, there, but there was nothing happening. It was also 7 a.m. in New York, so it was easier to watch yeah. in Ireland, if I recall <laughs> correctly. <laughs> uh, and that year, we had 2.3 million people come into our website. So from the point of view of connecting, uh, we have engaged uh, social media. Uh, Zoom has been a tremendous uh, innovation for us in relation to engaging people to become more active uh, in the organization of the parade. Um, let's just say, because of Zoom, my stress level has dropped dramatically because now I, I become more of a manager in relation to uh, the operational aspect of the parade. Um, prior to Zoom, people didn't show up for meetings, so you had to do a lot of the stuff yourself. So it's, it's fantastic. Um, but like I say, in, moving forward with Irish America, um, from the point of view of engagement, um, like the, the team theme here is it, uh, evolving diaspora. In the United States, it is really dramatically evolving. Uh, less and less people are coming to the United States because of immigration restrictions. Um, so there needs to be a, a more grassroots type engagement with the diaspora there to maintain what Ireland has enjoyed uh, all the years with immigrants going to the United States. And that is connectiveness, um, economic connectiveness. Ireland has tremendously benefited uh, somewhere in the region, close to almost a half a trillion dollars are invested by North American corporations in Ireland, accounting for maybe 250,000 jobs. Um, that connectiveness Ireland has enjoyed because of their immigrants, which are now restricted from going to the United States in the last 20 to 30 years. And to maintain that, connectedness economically as well as the political influence that the Irish Americans have in the United States as well as globally that has helped Ireland with things like Brexit and the prevention of a hard border on the island of Ireland and the Good Friday Agreement with George Mitchell. It's important that there is a real engagement of uh, and connectedness and a greater effort put into it. Uh, Mark Daly is the only Here. person, I don't know where Mark is, but Mark Daly is uh, coming out to the United States. He's the only person that I see from Ireland engaging at the state level the politicians who will become the governors, who will become the next Senate generation of senators and Congress people, and all eventually, hopefully, President of the United States. But there needs to be a lot more work done like that. Um, the future generation leaders in, of Irish America um, is in jeopardy. And uh, at some point, uh, voting rights, uh, along with Kevin Sullivan over here, uh, we're going to release a paper about how to engage uh, the future leaders of Irish America because that is not looking good at the moment because of lack of immigration. And as I said earlier, 85% between 18 and and 30 Irish Americans are not engaged in any organization. And that's a scary number for the future of the relationship between Irish America and Ireland. We have three continents yes. represented <laughs> up here and I could happily go down a US rabbit hole with you. What I will say though is, and I know that at last count Coral and Mark Daly does get out there and yes. be, beat the pavements, but also you're saying of, of Irish representatives meeting state house, meeting in state houses every consulate across the US is doing that on a weekly basis. And it's important to say that as well. He's not, he's not marching alone out there. Yeah. Um, but to pick up your last point around engagement and the role of voting rights, I know it's a, a it can be a controversial topic in some, in some ways. There's a commitment in the programme for government to, and I'll, I'll read it out because I have it here. So, yeah. To hold a referendum on extending the franchise at presidential elections to citizens living outside the state. The commitment is there. 
um, made by all of my bosses, so I'm not going to dispute it one way or another and agree with it. But just going back, and it's a US example rather than anything else, I remember holding, in the preparation of the current diaspora strategy, holding a consultation in the consulate in New York with about 20 Irish organisations for their views across everything, welfare, culture, um, new diasporas, new communities, all of these issues, and voting rights, and put the question out to the room, we asked, asked for people's views. And what really surprised me was the majority of the room, to a great degree, had great reluctance about it. They felt that, but I think the, if I recall correctly, the main reason that was expressed was an acknowledgement that they wouldn't live with the, have to live with the results of the decisions that they made, and they expressed great reluctance about it. Now, I know there are those who are very active push, pushing for it, and there is the government commitment, but I'd be curious, your, vote, your work at votingrights.ie, we'll, we'll come back to you at the end maybe, and you have strong views on it, but I'd be curious for Brian, Alan, and, and Cathy, for your views on it, and if you feel comfortable giving a sense of what your communities think about it. You may not feel comfortable with that, but maybe yeah. for yourself first, Brian. Um, we did a consultation with our membership uh, in 2021. It was our biggest ever. Our membership, organizations, individual members, other stakeholders, Irish press. Um, and it didn't feature hugely in the responses we got back. Now, this was in the teeth of the pandemic. People potentially had other priorities in terms of sustainability and cost of living. Um, but there is a very committed and vocal uh, group who very much support it um, and organize around that. One of our member organizations uh, votes for Irish citizens abroad. Um, so, so there is an active cohort. Um, my sense is I'd be interested to see, now that the pandemic and COVID disruption has subsided, is there now room and the space to engage in a wider debate with the community on it? That's certainly our intention, is to go back to our membership. We'll open it out at our next AGM and take the temperature again um, because we'd like to engage with it and we'd really like to understand the argument amongst our, our membership and the wider community. So I think that's going to be our next step, but um, it's certainly something we want to make space for. Kathy, you might. So it's really interesting. I We've been open for 12 <coughs> years, uh, 11 and a half years, as, as an Irish resource centre really across Canada. And in that time, not once has any of our constituents reached out with questions about this or indeed with an opinion about it. Now, we're, uh, we don't operate in the advocacy sphere. We're a services organisation, so it may be that they, they don't see us as a partner in this conversation. But when we do focus groups, when we speak to them about what are your needs, this doesn't come up. Um, that said, uh, there are clearly people in Canada who want to have the conversation. I think we just, they're, they're, they're not a vocal majority yet. And now that we have, we have an embassy in Ottawa, but now that we have two more consulates finally in Canada, one in Toronto and one in Vancouver, this might be a wonderful opportunity for them to host these conversations and, and talk to both the young and the old around the issue. But I, I, it has always struck me that our constituents have not brought it up, either on our social media platforms, uh, or at our at our one-to-one -one sessions, it's, I'm not saying it's not important to them, but they're not vocalizing it, which is something to consider. I think when when government and community starts to reach out about the conversation, why are the newer uh, um, uh, immigrants not talking about this yet? And maybe it is a yet. Maybe there's a point in life. With these things, I think you so. as you described earlier, people have different stages. Alan, what, what are you, um, you here in so New South Wales? From an Irish uh, support agency perspective, we're completely non-political and non-denominational, so I'll only give a view from, from myself and um, I suppose my own cohort of, of, of friends and social network. But um, it is something that I think is, is, is slightly starting to rise and slightly important. And I think it's on the back of a number of conversations that I've been very fortunate to have both with the Department of Foreign Affairs um, in recent times in Sydney and as well with um, various visiting government ministers to Australia in the, in the previous past, asking the question, why, why don't you come home? What's, what, what is it that's holding you there? Um, and I think it's something simple like a vote in the presidential election um, gives you that sense of connection to, to Ireland in a sense of, you know, picking our, our state for fair head versus being involved in local politics and local elections and things that matter on the ground that can impact people. So to, to Brian's point, having a reach from outside in I, I, I would say I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't think that that's the position. 
that we should be, or the, the power that we should be able to, to hold over the country. But certainly, when it comes to long-term sustaining change in policy that might impact me in the next five or 10 years if I were to, to move home, um, that's something that I'd like to have a voice or an opinion on, the future shape of Ireland, versus none at all. And then sit there and face that question, well, why aren't you coming home? Well, policy or procedure or, or government or things have changed that I didn't have a voice in. And um, I do have, and I'm very fortunate um, to have that voice, obviously, in, in the country that I, I call home at the moment, Australia. So I am you know, active in making sure that I, I cast my ballot and I cast my vote. Um, I don't believe in sitting on the fence. You're very conscious that you have, a, as an immigrant, you still have a stake. In yeah, that. and I think that's what's important to me. It's just to feel that connection. And it, for me, it's, even if it's just that one element of it, it's, you know, it's, it's really, really important that I think you've got that connection. And if you want to keep that, that door open, that's, that's one way of doing that, to keep that connection to Ireland. Because again, as you flow through generations, and flow through, certainly I'm 11, heading for 12 years in Australia. Without that connection, you read a bit in the news, you kind of might lose interest and then you start to slip and drift away. Um, and unfortunately for some, some people, when they move back, or they choose to move back, so we've got some seniors now that they want to repatriate back to Ireland and they want to have, live out their, their golden years here. They're, they're moving to a country that they, they know very little about. They've had no input into the shape of Ireland in the last 25, 30 years. And it's a challenge for them. They just don't understand the systems. Um, so I think that's something that would keep that engagement, um, certainly at the kind of the, at the lowest level versus getting involved in local politics and, and selecting the government um, for today. Okay, thanks. I'm going to go to Hillary yeah. next, but before I do, after Hillary, we're going to open up to questions from the floor. And for those who, are, who, who may be watching on YouTube, there, you can submit questions via Slido. We already have one question in. So please be ready with your questions, because I know enough of you to lay the hand upon you if you don't volunteer. <laughs> um, Hillary, we know you have strong views directly on it yourself, but could I ask, you a different, ask it a bit differently? You're engaged with the community in all, a whole manner of, of ways. For the people with whom you engage, how high is it for them up their agenda? You know, everyone, there are lots of issues facing the diaspora communities. How in, high up is it? In relation rights? to representation, Anytime I mention it to anybody in New York, is, uh, when I say, is there, if you have an issue in Ireland, is there anybody you can go to? And the answer is a resounding no. Um, I spoke at the Irish Business Organization last year in a room full of business people, and every one of them says, no, there's nobody here. One of the issues is in relation to engagement. Um, presidential vote would certainly help but a representative that represents our needs here in Ireland. We're all Irish nationals, we live abroad, we're all Irish citizens, and once we step off the island of Ireland, we lose our right to vote. All we have to do is move to the north of Ireland and we lose our right to vote. We're still, we're born, we're raised here, Ireland is our home, and that, that comes out over and over again and yet there's no connectiveness from Ireland to us in relation to something as simple as a vote. Now, when it comes to representation, uh, for me, um, the Supreme Court recently ruled that the university panels was unconstitutional. Well, in the fix of that, why can't there be a constituency for diaspora people? to elect using the same system that the university panel uses, which is a mail-in voting ballot. Um, why is that important? Well, it's important because in the last two years, 39,000 people returned to Ireland. They have difficulty getting driving licenses, mortgages, uh, and every mundane thing that a person who lived here, who never left, has no problem in getting. And who's there to represent them and to help them as they go through that, even before they come here? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Nobody's here. There is a real need for us as members of Irish citizens abroad. We're not a diaspora. We're not immigrants. We are Irish citizens. We come from Ireland, we're connected to Ireland through our citizenship, and yet we have nobody here to represent our interests. We're all interested in the success of Ireland, 
if we weren't the people who went before us, uh, like I say, I threw out a number, a half a trillion dollars from North America. That wasn't done by the uh, people not engaging with the diaspora in the United States in the corporate boardrooms of North America. That's how that was done. They had vested interests going back generational or recent in the success of Ireland. And we all have an interest in the success of Ireland. But for us to get to the next level and for Ireland to get to the next level with that engagement, we need some kind of representation. And a good start would be a vote in a limited constituency for the President of Ireland, but also in the Shannon, not the Dáil. The Dáil is the legislative part of the Oireachtas. The Shannon is not. They determine and govern the nation. The Shannon does not. That's where the representation would be satisfactory for the diaspora in having representation to help us to engage Ireland more, but more importantly, to help Ireland to engage us more. It's a, there's a real need. But well, I will say, the Shannon does approve legislation and amend legislation along the way. But what, before, but I, I, and what I will say as well, to honestly defend, the, my Irish politicians have an extraordinary interest and affinity with the diaspora. When you see them going out for St. Patrick's Day, I think everybody in this room would give lie to this kind of sense that they go and, they're going for junkets. They're out there, they want to listen to the diaspora. So I'm not saying that doesn't satisfy your particular questions, perhaps, but Irish, Irish politicians, again, of every hue, do get out there and want to engage with diaspora communities. It's part because emigration is, for good reasons and bad, a, such a part of what we are as a nation. So I, I just know that for myself from watching politicians over the last 30 years professionally. They do engage with the diaspora. At this controversial point, it's probably the best time to open it up to the floor, I'm sure. Um, unsurprisingly, the first question is from the elegant gentleman with the moustache over here on my right, Ted Smith. <laughs> oh, Ted. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, Ted Smith. Sorry, Ted. Is it Garland. possible to get a little more light in the room or else less in our eyes because it's very hard nope. to see people? Perfect. Thank oh, you. Great. Great stuff. Thanks, Kieran, and thanks everybody who's organized this conference, Aidan, and uh, really appreciate it. Uh, but I sort of remember when Jack Lynch was Taoiseach, and some of you won't remember who Jack Lynch was, but the big controversy was would the government introduce uh, legislation allowing contraception? And Jack was asked about this on television. He said, ah, you know, contraception, we're going to put it on the long finger. <laughs> now, I feel like representation for Irish abroad is going to be put on the long finger. And uh, there'll be lots of yes, yes, yes. Give them every actual assistance, short of any actual help. Um, so, you know, Hillary has, and the other members of the panel, have voiced very clearly uh, what could be done, uh, including the Shannad, uh, the university seat arrangements, various ways to engage and activate the Irish diaspora. You know, all of us out there in the field realize that it's, it's a waning thing. You know, we're not sending in new em emigrants from Ireland, thank goodness. But uh, if you want to keep the diaspora alive, it can't just be a one-way thing. We've got to engage with it in different ways. And um, I would just love to know, and maybe the minister could answer this question, what is the reluctance, because there seems to be some reluctance, to take a shot at this or to lead the Irish voters in supporting something like we're talking about? Uh, just to give Irish citizens abroad uh, more of a voice. I, I just sense that there's something, some obstacle, and we can talk as much as we like here every three years, but it won't necessarily go forward. So I don't know how we get the answer to that, but I think we'd crack it if we could. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ted. I'd say too, I mean, I suppose I opened that part of the conversation by referencing the commitment to the Programme for Government, so the commitment is there. I won't, unless he, unless he really, really begs me to do so, put the minister on the spot right now, because he, he already was up here taking questions. But I know the minister is going to be with us for, for most of the, if not all of the day. Yeah, exactly. Um, the minister will talk to people in the room later on, to yourself, Ted, and others who have specific questions to raise. Like, like um, in, the, in the next election, there's going to be an increase in the number of TDs because of the increase in population. Why can't there be something similar done in the, the Shannon? for representation for us. That might be an opportunity, as well as the Supreme Court ruling. Yeah, well, There's there, two reasons. There are lots of ways to slice and dice it, but we try to stick to <laughs> principles, if we can, Henry, rather than debating the legislation for it, if we can. I saw there was a hand up over here. 
the gentleman over here in pink and in blue sweater I can't really see it's bright is this on? it is yeah <laughs> Uh, Mark McCormick, uh, yeah, I just had an idea off the back of something that Cathy said, it was just prompted. Um, uh, is an output of this, uh, or a takeaway going to be, that th this collection of ideas that we have for engaging with younger people, is there a resource on your website or somewhere where we can document the ideas that are generated here and add to them, um, like over the kind of coming months and, we and years, and say what, what has and what hasn't work, worked for each of the different areas? Because uh, uh, Cathy prompted something I just thought about. There's a, a local GEA club that's close to us. Um, so we're, we're based in London, Irish Community Services. And there's a Coo Cullen GEA club there as well. And we, we're trying to engage with them, uh, with the younger people there. But it comes back to what do we have to offer them that they need? And a lot of them, are, they're quite young. They're in that kind of life cycle where their needs are not really necessarily serviced by what we kind of, what our, what our kind of you know, spot is, that what we do. And then it made me think, OK, the, the digital channels that you talked about, Cathy, could we kind of partner with recruitment firms that have Irish connections in there and bring them down and us facilitate meeting with the people in the GEA that are like ultimately everyone's going to need a job at some point or you know is looking to change career could you facilitate a partner with the recruitment firm and them um, off the off the bat I know a guy from Dunleary who works in a recruitment firm who just happens to be looking for new clients bring them down to Cullens or we facilitate a session in ours that's just one idea but it's no good me having that idea in isolation and sitting at this table and maybe talking about it. If there was a resource where we could like document this, as I said, it's a living, breeding kind of resource that people can say, okay, that, that did work in London or didn't work in London. Brian's got loads of experience throughout the years. I'm sure he's seen different things that have worked in the UK. You know, could we build on something like that and, and maybe kind of have a, I suppose, an initial whiteboarding session where we say, these are all the ideas of the room. This is, you know, this is what we think off the back would work. Document it and that's kind of your, your, your breeding document. So anyway, that's, uh, sorry, that was quite a long observation, no, it, it, but there it you go. No, it was great. I w what I would say is, and again, we come to the panel. I, I'll take one more question from the panel, and then for me some responses. To a degree, that's what we're doing today and tomorrow, is everyone is in this room together to share lessons of what works and what don't. Hope, hopefully there are quite some lessons of things that don't work also. And when you get to the breakout sessions and we're in a less vast setting, there'll be a chance to share those ideas. But maybe the panelists would have other ideas. But I might take one further Canadian question well, sorry, over here. So on, on that point, the, my main point is the output of those sessions, because you want to see something that, that's tangible and it's actually accessible by us when we leave, <coughs> like, you know, four or five months down the line, what's working up in Edinburgh, what's working in different places. It'd be great to be able to access that and then for that to be a living, breathing thing and not just to be a thing that we do for a couple of days here and move on and everyone's got, got stuff going on in their lives, yeah. you know what I mean? We want to be able to reference this and use it on an ongoing basis. I, I know the Global Irish Economic Forum, maybe the, the sister form of this for a while did when it did that it kind of published the outcomes and then progress reports i'm not going to put my colleagues in the irish abroad unit on the hook to, to definitely do it but the, the idea is there we might come here to, uh, um, bill isn't it yes in here with in the green it's a microphone we can over and we come back to the panel then maybe for some responses Thank you and uh, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is William Peace. Uh, I am from Canada. Thank you uh, for remembering, Mr. Madden. Uh, just three things uh, that I thought of just listening to the panel that they might opine on. Uh, first and foremost, I, I've never liked the term old versus new Irish. I don't think it really encapsulates the issue. I did my research on the Irish in Silicon Valley and there was lots of young people who would go to a bar on Geary Street, talk to a man who would tell them, go talk to this gentleman and get a job. Uh, they were generally in the more traditional uh, careers, uh, bricklayers, construction, uh, people more involved in, the, in uh, highly educated contemporary jobs didn't need to do that. So I think old and new doesn't really kind of encapsulate that. I, I will also say that transition is not quite the same as decline. Um, uh, pu uh, Putnam has been talking about social capitalism changing since the 90s. It's not just an Irish problem. Uh, people are engaging differently. Uh, across the globe. Uh, I would say the decline in America is specific uh, to an immigration issue as well and the, the lack of visas anymore. I wouldn't say anyone in Australia or anyone in Canada or anyone in Britain is talking about a decline in the Irish community. Uh, but what they want and how they're engaging is transitioning very, very clearly. And that's not the first time. I mean, if you look at the American um, uh, position, it started with Tammany Hall, it moved to Angel Order of the Hibernians, it moved to uh, the American Ireland Foundation, then it moved to the 
uh, the Ireland funds, uh, now it's the Irish Arts Centre is, is one of the big elements. So there's just these transitions over time and we are in a period of transition. But there's a great opportunity there for lifelong engagement and we're seeing this. What a 10 year old born in a foreign country but of Irish descent needs from Irish identity is very different to a 20 year old, very different to a 50 year old and organizations can actually, there's a great opportunity to create these lifelong engagements. So, you know, education in Irish language, Irish history for children, then moving into a party and a beer and a chat with young people, then moving into arts and culture when you get a bit older and beginning to want to give back and ultimately as you get older as well, needing social services, engagement, community and all of that. So I think there's a vast amount of opportunities for organizations to get together. And it's not about the, the large, big institutes setting up one singular idea of Irish identity. It's lots of different organizations getting together and engaging with people at different times and kind of creating that lifelong uh, transition throughout it. So sometimes it's art, sometimes it's culture, a lot of times it's GAA, and then other times it's education as well. And I think that's a fantastic opportunity to see. So I, I just want to kind of say that certainly from a Canadian position, we don't see decline, we see exponential growth. And it's very exciting and it's very engaging. And we see people engaging in their Irish identity in a very interesting and, and new way as well. Might if I go take one more and I'll read one from the screen and then go back to yourselves, but it'll, it'll be neater to finish, help us finish up, I think, on time. You. Thank you. You can bear with me uh, on the Canada front again. I'm Jackie Gilna, um, and I'm chair of the Ireland Canada Business Council, among other things. But I want to just circle back on a, on a number of uh, topics or a number of parts of the conversation. Cathy, you mentioned um, that the uh, young folks going over to Canada now, and you and I know each other well, that they're not aware yet of their option to vote and what that means to them, because they might leave in two years. And they keep their right till they're 18 months in Canada or 18 months abroad. So if we, if we address the, the, the core problem of communications, how do we communicate more effectively between the Irish abroad? Let's park the word diaspora for now and say the Irish abroad. They're Irish citizens. They have a significant economic impact on this country. To and from the island of Ireland, we promote business and the economic growth to the best of our ability. What we need from the government here is we need a connection to us away, not just from us inbound to Ireland. Mm -hmm. We need it more in the organizations that we have in the chambers of commerce. We need a closer working relationship with our embassies and trade commissioners. The chambers need to be part of Team Ireland and not outside of it so that communities see that we are speaking with one voice to promote the economic growth. How do we maintain the interest to help Ireland grow and develop economically? Engage with the people away and give them the vote. But in doing so, please use the expression to the Irish people who have to go to the referendum. Irish abroad are not trying to influence the day-to-day -day lives of people here. We are trying to influence the economic or contribute to the economic growth of this country by having engagement. And you may say the presidential vote may not achieve that, but I tell you it will because it keeps us connected. I am an Irish citizen. I want the right to vote. I will continue, as many of our colleagues in, in Canada, um, engaging in various organizations to help economic growth. But it comes down to communications, and each of you on the panel today have mentioned that. We need clear, precise, or concise, clear messaging in a digital format that reaches all ages now and to engage not just from the government, but from the semi-state agencies and the private sector coming together. Don't let this forum disappear like the economic forum did. We lost the power and the influence of all of us who attended. So I encourage the government, and thank you for what you've done today in organizing this, uh, certainly uh, post uh, Biden visit. Um, I'm sure everybody's exhausted, but please don't let this forum fall apart with no outcomes as the gentleman over here was saying. We need outcomes, we need to measure the outcome of this event and forthcoming events so that we can effectively deliver the solutions and not just sit and talk with each other. We're tired of that. We want outcomes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Jackie. Thanks, Jackie. I was about to um, say Canada is doing very well here being heard. Eamon, Eamon McKee, our ambassador in Ottawa, is out there somewhere. You're doing them all very proud by raising your voices. There's a gentleman with hand up down here. I'm actually not going to get to him because I'm under time pressure from Aidan Cronin here in the front, but I will 
because I want to go back to the panel, because that, that's, that, that's what they we, we invited them up here because of their expertise and their experience. You've heard what the, what the audience have said so far. Um, there's some overlap between sessions, so those who have questions can bring them up later again. I want to read one question that came in on the um, Slido, and maybe put one final question to you, and then you can use it as a wrap-up, or you can use it as a kick to us, or whatever you see, see fit. You, you can use it to go back to Jackie if you want to <laughs> at that point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Deirdre Niwahuna, I don't know where she's tuning in from, but said, Cathy's evidence we young immigrants rings true, yet COVID did a brilliant job of masking real vulnerabilities. How do we meet needs when things go wrong? Now, I think COVID, as I think a couple of, of the contributors on the stage <coughs> said earlier, actually did a fantastic job of showing how communities could pull together when it's really, really necessary. I saw it myself firsthand. The word pivot was abused during COVID, but they pivoted and the organizations pivoted and helped those who were in real need. So give that question, the question on the floor. I was going to try to draw together with a question. Government isn't the sole driver of diaspora engagement. We are one part of a very complex web. It started ground up. There was diaspora engagement across our, especially all of your four communities where the four of you reside, long before there was even an Irish state. It has been ground up. We're part of that network. We're a part that brings money. Hopefully we bring some support. But for each of you, if there was one thing you think that we should be doing more of, doing differently, doing better, not just not more ESP money, that's an easy answer. And I think, I, but I, I know one person will come back to voting rights, but so we, we let you go, we let you go first, Hillary. But for the rest of you come back, what's the one thing you would say, okay, government, you're part of this network, but you're an important part of it. This is the one thing we could do more of. Hillary, we'll start with you and probably voting rights. Uh, Jackie mentioned a clear communication from Ireland. Well, a couple of years ago, we had one. It was Senator Billy Lawless. He represented our interests. He was the most busiest, the busiest senator here in the Shannon. And that's, that's a clear message. That's a clear line of communication from Ireland to the diaspora, but more importantly, to help the diaspora to communicate back when they are returning to Ireland, when they want to engage Ireland in investment, creating employment in Ireland. It's a clear line of communication. And that's, to me, is a real, real need to have some kind of representation here in Ireland to represent our interests. The government gets 11 appointments in the Shannon, and they didn't appoint one person to represent the diaspora in the last uh, formation of the Shannon. I think that should be a permanent appointment. If, if a constituency can't be created, which it should be, but a permanent appointment to represent the Shannon should be a commitment that the government should give us, leave, leaving this forum, if possible, uh, to show that they're serious about engaging with us, but more importantly for us to be able to engage in clear lines of communications to use Jackie's words. It's a, it's a clear message, Hillary, and why I know Senator Billy, or then, then Senator Billy Lawless did huge work there. Yeah. I also could point you at 59 men and women who would dispute that he was the hardest working, because each of them would say the same thing about <laughs> themselves. I, I know a few of them myself. <laughs> <laughs> Brian and Michael. Yeah, um, just quickly to answer a, a point that came up there. I mean, one of the key things in terms of the changing diaspora, and I appreciate the word is sometimes loaded, is if you looked at the um, European Football Championship in Britain a few years ago, it wasn't uncommon to see families with English and Irish jerseys. Um, there's a generation of people very comfortable to hold dual identity without the tension, without the tensions that people of my generation still feel battered by in some ways. And how progressive is that? And I think we can link that back as a bellwether to the positivity in British-Irish relations since the Good Friday Agreement. But one of the key asks would be, it wasn't about more ESP money, it was about evolving it, uh, the relationships between uh, well-run and skilled organizations to drive the diaspora policy. It's not always about money, it's about using the expertise and skills. Bring us into the tent when, when we're uh, generating the next diaspora policy. Bring us in and talk to us. Um, we'd be happy to contribute. And, and I know Irish and Britain has so much to contribute. Um, yeah, look, I'd obviously echo Brian and Hillary's points, both of them. I think it's really important in relation to, you know, ESP or policy or how that evolves into the future. It's not about asking for more. It is about being involved in that conversation. So particularly from 
you know, from Australia's perspective, you apply for funding at a point in time and, and, and several things shift and change. So it's about being able to have that conversation about the evolution versus kind of, you know, um, it's a moment in time. And the world moves exponentially faster these days than it did two, three years ago. Um, the other part for me, I suppose, the, the call to the government, and it's to probably echo Hillary here, is to acknowledge the, um, the Irish citizens and the Irish abroad. And I think make, make it known, or I suppose certainly make it easier, that there is this constant call out um, and for us to come home. Unfortunately, Ireland has lost a generation of, of young people that were educated free by the state. Um, to the US, to Australia, to Canada, to the multiple multiple countries that are that are here today and representing um, Ireland. And I think that question about, should, would you come home? It's, it, it's, it's quite difficult because even to come home and to set up uh, life and to bring partners that are not Irish citizens into the country for working rights, et cetera, it, there's just that, it, 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 they're all small barriers. But when you put 10 small barriers in front of a person, it becomes a wall. Yep. Um, and it's just a lot easier, and I definitely hear it in the Irish community below. It's too hard. We'll wait till the kids are educated. And I guarantee you, by the time you wait till the kids are educated, life is set. Life is set. So I, I don't want Ireland to lose the opportunity it has invested in the likes of the, the, the younger generations. Um, if they do want to come home, they've made the decision to go. They are now struggling with that decision at a point in time. It's too difficult to come home. And there is this constant mourning. And, and I can speak for a person, you mourn for the life that you had yeah. and your family and your friends. But when you're in Australia and you've built that life and family and friends and you've, you've started from scratch, you're also mourning the what if. So it's thinking about if I leave this, I'll start again. And you're, you're in that constant gray area. Um, and one of those barriers to getting you through the gray area is the difficulty it is actually as a returning Irish abroad or a returning immigrant and rebooting your life uh, with no connection and again, no voting rights, where's my polling card, I have no idea. So it's, it's just recognizing that and making sure that there is a, a voice and a, I suppose an acknowledgement for, for, that, for that Irish abroad at all times in Ireland. These forums are amazing, but how do we make sure that it's 365 days a year? There is, there's representation for the multiples of millions. Um, I think if we all came home, poor old Ireland would probably sink under the pressure <laughs> of people claiming Irish heritage, be it first, second or third generation, there's standing room only. So phenomenal opportunity to, to really connect with that community and drive Ireland. Yes. <laughs> Kathy. I'll pick up on something that, that Jackie said as part of my concluding remarks. Um, Jackie mentioned Team Ireland. And I would invite the government and, and the Emigrant Support Program to consider the diaspora and, and the agency supporting them as a part of Team Ireland because of, we understand completely um, Tourism Ireland, IDA, Enterprise Ireland, clearly the state-based agencies, they are Team Ireland, but they're not Team Ireland alone. And organizations like our Chambers of Commerce, uh, organizations like our center and, 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 and the sister centers across the world um, there is an economic impact. Our clients, <coughs> our constituents, uh, they do make an economic contribution. The, the roles they go into in various sectors, they can influence foreign direct investment into Ireland. Um, they can also uh, influence many other aspects of culture. They're accidental ambassadors that can help tourism. So I think if there's an opportunity when Team Ireland gathers in our various countries to include us, the diaspora and, and our community organizations, I think there could be a real value add and we would welcome the opportunity for that partnership. I'll briefly come back to Brian. I wasn't at all saying that you were looking for more money. I actually had written down a conclusion here. That I'm not saying no. <laughs> not, oh, I, I, I didn't expect that. But I actually written down that question about partnership in the SP and how we can bring more and more knitting together of that. I was also very taken by William Pete's phrase transition is not the same as decline. If we're looking at the whole, this, this very broad question of the evolution, sometimes it can be framed negatively. Oh, we, there are fewer of us, there are fewer of us. One, there aren't fewer of us. We reproduce, it's just that we're losing, some people are losing the connection and it's incumbent on all of us to work to keep that connection alive and all of you are doing that. Um, another point to, I suppose to take out of the room is the question around people want to know what, okay, we've had, we've had a discussion here, we have a discussion for the day, we'll have a discussion tomorrow. And then what? So we'll have to go back to you on what, on what the and then what looks like. 
And I think there might be some humour for representation around the room, some, some interest in representation around the place. Oh, yeah, just a little. <laughs> um, the last thing I want to say is just a thank you to the panellists, but to the panellists, to all of you here and so many others elsewhere who might or might not be watching. Me and my DFA colleagues dotted around the room. We go out and live among you for a few years at a time. We kind of pretend we're a bit like you. But we, we get to go and support Irish organisations, Irish music, Irish culture, Irish business, and get paid directly to do it. A tiny minority of you get paid for this. Most of you do it voluntarily. You're doing it Saturday nights. You're stuffing envelopes. Or in the well, say, old days, you're stuffing envelopes. Now you're working up yeah, your spreadsheets. <laughs> uh, and it's a huge piece of work that you do. So I'll say a really, really big thank you to you and through you to everyone else like you around the world for the work that you do for the Irish diaspora. Thank you very much. <laughs>
get everybody settled, settled in for this next one. everybody welcome back if everybody wants to start making their way in and taking a seat we'll get a, ourselves set for the second panel today Uh, that hush is always good. Um, so if everybody wants to make their way to the seats, I noticed there was a few people standing on the last panel. There's loads of seats up towards the front. Don't be afraid. Come on forward. Sit down. Rest your feet. It's going to be a long couple of days. Uh, so there's plenty of space for everybody. Um, just to mark your cards, we're going to have this panel now on values, and then we're going to have a lunch break. And within that lunch break, there is the opportunity to attend an optional talk, which looks to be fascinating. Dr. Catherine Healy, who is the Epic Museum Historian in Residence, is going to give an, a talk on, uh, for us on diaspora histories, recovering the voices of Irish female emigrants. That's really important. Uh, lots of those stories untold. Um, so that's going to be an optional talk for us during lunch. Uh, but now we're going to welcome our second panel for the day. This one is going to be hosted by Miss Emer Rock, Director of Strategy at Governance and Change at the Department of Foreign Affairs. So I'll welcome Emer onto the stage along with all the panelists. Now this one uh, is obviously on values, our second theme, inclusive inclusivity, diversity, and belonging amongst Irish diaspora communities. So welcome everybody. Hi everybody. I think it's okay to still say good morning, but I think only just about. So um, good morning everybody. Uh, delighted to see so many familiar faces. As has been said, my name is Ema Rock. I'm currently the Director of Strategy, Governance and Change in the department, but a lot of you will know me from my previous existences as former Director for Irish Broad Unit, uh, Director for British-Irish Relations, and most recently, Deputy Ambassador in the Embassy in Washington. So diaspora engagement and, and working with, with all of your communities has been a real big feature of my career for the last, well, over decade plus at this stage. So i um, delighted to be joined here by a, a, an absolutely stellar panel. Uh, we've got Pauline, Dennis, Lorraine, and Miriam. And I, I think I'll let them introduce themselves as, as we go on. Um, I think the piece that we're about to talk about, about diversity and inclusion and belonging, is 
is probably some of the more challenging parts of our diaspora story because you know we we've seen for the last week um, we've had President Biden who, as it's been said, wears his Irishness on his sleeve, and that's that's probably the more traditional type of emigration that we've we've been dealing with and we've and we've talked about over the years and you know the, the famine and and all of that, but. There's another part, and I think over the years during my work in it, and I've seen it, there's a, a piece about our immigration, immigration story that kind of remained hidden for a long time and that reflected a society perhaps that we're not particularly proud of. Um, thankfully, things have changed, but you know, I, I think a lot of people felt that they didn't belong in Ireland and that society was, wasn't a very compassionate place and that that our values were maybe more for show than, than actually lived experiences. So I think maybe if we can maybe talk a little bit about that and maybe see where, where we need to go and how we need to support and how these different communities can enrich and uh, teach us a lot about, about our, our more modern society now. So I think I might go through the panelists, maybe slightly different to the way Kieran did it, um, and, and just let each of you introduce yourselves and maybe just tell a, f a little bit about your own stories and then, and then maybe have a discussion as amongst ourselves and before we open it up to the, to the, to the floor. So and you'll have to bear with me. I have glasses will come on and they'll come off. I can't see a thing beyond the stage, so uh, please, please be kind. So um, maybe Pauline. Uh, Pauline Anderson is, uh, is the traveler movement. Um, maybe do you want to talk a little bit about your story? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Pauline Melvin Anderson, and I am firstly very, very pleased to be here. So, I'd like to thank the Irish government and uh, this forum for inviting me um, as a representative of both the travel community and the travel movement, which is a charity, uh, national charity based in London that covers the UK. There is a counterpart in Ireland, um, the traveller movement in Ireland, and we do have a good relationship there. So I'm a proud Irish traveller woman. Uh, my mum is Mary, uh, Mary Bridget O'Driscoll of Cork. Um, so you just don't quite get any more Irish than that. I feel very Irish. My family feel Irish. We support Irish rugby. You know, you can... Uh, but the, the thing is, listening to me, you might uh, be aware <laughs> that I actually can wear the, what I call the Harry Potter cloak of invisibility which is extremely useful um, for good and for bad. And I'll talk about the good and bad in a minute. But, you know, I hear and I see things that perhaps I don't want to, but actually are very, very useful. So in a professional environment, um, I, my day job is I'm the director of education for Derby City Council um, in the Midlands. I have been a teacher and a headmistress, which I think is called a principal uh, here in Ireland. Um, so, you know, a, a different route from many uh, perceptions of uh, Irish travellers that some people might have. Um, my uh, role with the traveller movement is a voluntary role. I'm chair of the Board of Trustees, and we are an organisation that provides um, legal um, advice. We have an education arm. We work with the Ministry of Justice very closely with the British government. We're based in London and are very close to Parliament. Um, we produce a lot of research papers, etc. So much less of a frontline organisation helping individuals than you might think. There are other organisations which, which do that. And I chair and have chaired the National Conference for the Traveller Movement for the last 15 years. Keep saying, can someone else do it? But, <laughs> you know, keep wheeling me out, really. Um, so, you know, it's just a really interesting perspective and being back in Ireland and, you know, Myself, my family, my communities, we, to us, Ireland is still home. We're coming home. Have you been home? When did you last go home? And, you know, I'm not sure that's always understood um, among other Irish people, that Irish travellers feel Irish and they do feel, we do feel this is home. Um, importantly, so, for example, most of my family graves are in Canturk and we come home to bury our people. So, 
what is it about, what are the issues facing us as a diaspora? Um, and I'll think about it in the good and the bad, so it's not all negative. And I'd say the good thing is this focus, um, certainly from the Irish government, and, and I have to thank the Irish Embassy in London for including and promoting and celebrating uh, traveller achievement and uh, uh, absolutely wonderful partnership that we have there with the embassy. So great tribute uh, to them. Um, we, uh, the other good things that are happening is there are more and more uh, positive role models as people move through the education system and enter uh, the professions, the legal health, um, myself as an educationalist, you know, again, um, I suppose, uh, Busting those myths about what, what is a traveller, what is it to be a traveller. I think it's really important that we are addressing those racial stereotypes because, as you probably know, in the UK, Irish travellers have been a recognised ethnic group under the Race Relations Act since 2000 with protected characteristics associated with that in the law. That's really, really important and I think that's a key a key positive uh, message for us in, in, as a diaspora, particularly in the UK, UK. Excuse me. So, lots of positives. You've asked us uh, particularly about the role of women and girls, mm. and um, I do think that women and girls in the traveller movement are leading um, ahead of the men for a whole number of reasons, some of which you might be able to predict, but entering uh, education, uh, taking up professional roles, and uh, building on a long history of uh, female activism in, uh, in the traveller uh, community, uh, uh, reaching those the sort of high levels of acti activism in the UK. So that's all very, very positive. I, I do not want to dwell on the negative, but you would be aware, you would be highly aware of it. You know, we still do have that negative racial uh, stereotyping. Um, we still have uh, some of the lowest outcomes in terms of health. Um, life expectancy um, and in terms of you know the very bad uh, statistics around suicide so a young uh, traveler traveler males are 11 times more likely to die by suicide than uh, uh, other other communities so it's just really really very very uh, tragic and and I think what I would like to leave you with is that we are ourselves a very diverse community there are very wealthy travellers, there are very, very poor people. 80% of travellers live on or below the poverty line. So, you know, there are sort of misconceptions there around wealth. I think it's really important to understand that, um, you know, we are a changing and evolving community and diaspora, just as others are. And, you know, uh, give us the space, you know, we're asking for the space to actually show what we can achieve and how proud we are to, uh, of Ireland and what we can achieve uh, on behalf of our community. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. <laughs> I'm going to turn then to our, our token man on the panel, uh, <laughs> but, but, but makes up in so many ways. <laughs> um, Dennis, uh, we first met in, in Washington, um, but do you want to tell us a little bit about the organization you've founded and, and your story? So Dennis Brownlee from the African I can never, I never could do it when I, I spent, I, I don't know, many times I've got this wrong. The African American Irish Diaspora Network. It is uh, not yeah. the same time. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got it, it's a mouthful. And uh, you know, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to be on the panel, uh, Emer, and uh, to the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs uh, for having us to be part of uh, this, uh, this summit. Um, and you know, I'm, Pleased to be the uh, representative for diversity for males on the panel today. So, uh, <laughs> I'll try. I'll try to do do my part. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I first met Emer uh, probably about uh, a little over four years ago uh, when she was in Washington. And um, uh, as she said, I'm the uh, founder and chairman of the African American Irish Diaspora Network. And we call it Aiden, uh, or A-A-I-D-N, uh, so we don't try to, to say the whole thing all the time. Uh, but uh, we launched the organization uh, to connect African Americans with Ireland based on shared heritage and culture. Uh, and uh, a figure that uh, not a lot of people have been aware of is that uh, nearly 40% of African Americans have some Irish ancestry. Uh, and uh, what we're doing is we're connecting uh, the African-American and Irish communities 
not only based on that ancestry, but also uh, through other affinities. And so uh, we're working in areas of uh, education where we're providing uh, scholarships for African American students uh, to study in Ireland. We're arranging uh, student exchanges between uh, African American uh, uh, historically uh, black colleges and universities and Irish uh, universities. Uh, we are working in the area of trying to connect African American entrepreneurs with Irish businesses, technology uh, innovators, uh, and, and potential partners. Uh, and we're also working in, in cultural areas, in areas of music and art and literature and so forth. Uh, and importantly, uh, also looking at the uh, parallel social justice and civil rights movements uh, that have connected African Americans and, and, and the Irish over, over the centuries uh, through the struggle for, for freedom and, and true social justice and civil rights. Uh, so, so that's kind of the overview of the organization. Uh, so a lot of people ask me, well, why did you start this organization? You know, what, what motivated you to, to do this? And uh, it really goes back to um, uh, my youth when my, when my mother would tell me that we had uh, some Irish ancestry on her side. And I never really thought much about it as a, as a kid growing up in the, in the 1960s and 1970s in a, a very segregated area of, of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and I was more uh, focused at that time in my life in connecting with my African ancestry uh, and the civil rights movement and the black identity movement. And so, you know, back in the 70s, I, I had a very big Afro, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and that was, was really my focus until, you know, uh, Later in my adult life, and I was in Washington, D.C., and I had a, a neighbor and a very good friend. Uh, many of you here probably know her, uh, Stella O'Leary. She's been very active in the uh, uh, Irish diplomatic and political circles uh, for years, and, and currently actually is the uh, appointee of President Biden to the International Fund for Ireland. And uh, one day across the fence, uh, as we were, were, were talking, I, I almost jokingly said to Stella, I said, uh, Stella, you know, I got a little Irish in me, too. And uh, Stella took it very seriously. Uh, she bought me my first Ancestry DNA kit. <laughs> uh, and, you know, so I, I did the DNA sample and, and found out that, uh, you know, not only did I have some Irish ancestry on my, my mother's side, and, and that was Scotch-Irish ancestry, but there was, there was ancestry on my father's side. In fact, I found out uh, through also a, a, tw a 23andMe test that I did uh, that um, I have a lineage that goes through uh, Nile of the Nine hostages. And so when I told that to Stella, she said, well, my God, you're more Irish than I am. <laughs> of course, you know, 90% of Irish men are, <laughs> you know, associated with Nile of the Nine hostages in, in some way. He was very prolific. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, you know, that really motivated me, though. Well, when, 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 when that happened, Stella started int introducing me into the Irish community in, in Washington, D.C., and the reception that I got was so warm and welcoming. You know, it, it motivated me to learn more and explore the, the historic relationship between Irish Americans and African Americans and, and African Americans and Ireland. And I discovered all kinds of things. I mean, I discovered, you know, the whole history of Frederick Douglass and his historic journey to Ireland in 1845 and what a transformative visit that was for him. Um, his relationship with Daniel O'Connell. I learned that African Americans, in fact, in the late 19th century, were raising money to send to Ireland for the freedom movement, uh, you know, identifying with the quest for social justice and freedom that, that was going on here in Ireland. I also learned about the influence of the social justice and civil rights movement, of the black civil rights movement in, in America in the 1960s on the uh, civil rights movement in Northern Ireland uh, and the importance of the strategies and tactics that uh, were adopted by uh, John Hume in, 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 that, in, in that effort. And then the lifetime relationship that, that John Hume and, and John Lewis had. Um, and, and, and then, you know, even from a cultural standpoint, you know, the amalgamation of Irish traditional dance and African dance uh, in 
New York and lower Manhattan and other port cities that resulted in American tap dance and the influence of um, Irish traditional music with the African backbeat in the Appalachian that resulted in bluegrass music and the adoption of the African instrument of, 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 uh, of the Kora into the banjo and the, and, and the amalgamation of, of the banjo in, in, in Irish and in African American music. You know, all these things, you know, really excited me. And, you know, it, it, it led me to say, well, you know, how can we uh, communicate more of this to more people? And how can I share this experience with, with, with more of these people who share this affinity or this ancestry? And then in 2020, uh, 2019 actually, as we were heading towards 2020, which was the 175th anniversary of Frederick Douglass's uh, transformative visit to Ireland, um, you know, I thought that was a, a, a great opportunity uh, to, to try to broaden this message. And, and in fact, you know, I met Miriam during that time, and I talked to Miriam about it, and she was doing her work at, at New York University, uh, which also uh, inspired me. And, and she encouraged me to, to move forward with this. And uh, then I, I met Kieran Madden at the um, consulate in New York, and, and, and he and, uh, and, and I met Emer, and, and they encouraged me and said that it was an important part of Ireland's global diverse diaspora strategy to connect with these kinds of diverse diasporas. And I said, okay, well, I'll start an organization. <laughs> And, and, and we started uh, the African American Irish Dias Diaspora Network. And we had a wonderful launch event at uh, the residence of the uh, Council General of New York uh, in late February. It was Kieran Madden's res residence at the time. And uh, two weeks later, everything shut down for COVID. <laughs> so, you know, we were planning to arrange trips to Ireland uh, so people could walk in the steps of Frederick Douglass. And, and that was kind of one of the main things we were going to do. We were going to put up a website. I never imagined that we would get the kind of reaction and feedback that we did from so many Irish people and so many African American people to what we were doing. And particularly African Americans, when I would first talk to them and say, you know, what I was doing, and they'd say, well, why'd you do that? And I'd say, well, you know, almost 40% of African Americans have some Irish ancestry. And I can't tell you, you know, just from an anecdotal standpoint, how many of them said, well, you know, I got a little Irish in me too. <laughs> so, you know, I'll stop there and I look forward to having more of the discussion, but, but that's my story. That's great, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Dennis, that, that, that is a, that's a good place to stop and we, we pick that back up, but we'll move on to, to Lorraine, to Lorraine Marr. Thank you, Emma. Who's, um, who's the CEO of I Am Irish, so Lorraine, all yours. <laughs> Thank you. How do I follow those great speakers? Um, as Emer said, I'm Lorraine Ma. Um, whenever I get an audience, I have to tell you I'm from Carrick and Shore, County Tipperary, because when I think about identity, that feels like the strongest part of my identity. Um, and hence, I Am Irish. So I created a photographic exhibition in 2016 um, that highlighted those who were brown skinned from the Irish community. When I started that work, it was really about, it came really from a frustration of the lack of representation of what I see across Ireland and what I understand of myself as somebody who grew up in our wonderful country. And um, I realized that in my own community, there was lots of us, but when we looked at different Irish spaces, we just weren't seen in those spaces. Um, and in those days, I was uh, supporting the Association of Mixed Race Irish, uh, many of whom grew up in the industrial care home system here in Ireland. And they were setting up as an association at the time. And we went for a meeting at the London Irish Centre. And there was a lovely exhibition on there at the time. And after that, we cornered Gary, uh, <laughs> Gary Dunn, to say that we would like to have our images on that space. And, and he was really open to that, actually really supportive. And I think that that is one thing that I, uh, that, that's an offering to the room, actually, when we think about um, our diaspora, just that little moment of someone saying yes and opening a door just means everything. Um, and Gary did that. And so I, at the time, went home, went back to work, um, and I work in the creative industry not on stage. 
don't like the lights. But um, so I went back to work, and a friend of mine had a camera there, and I was like, come on, we're going out. And her, and her name was Tracy, Tracy Anderson, who also is a Jamaican woman who knew she had Irish ancestry. So we were like, we're going to tell these stories, we're going to write these stories. And we started talking to people that we knew, and we started taking the photographs. But what we found at that time is that there were some threads going through the stories that we were hearing. And often those threads were threads of people being exiled and people feeling like they didn't really belong. And so when we created the exhibition, we decided to just show the photos without the stories and say, these are Ireland's sons and daughters. They come from these families and these families and these families and these families. And I come from the Mars. I'm a, from part of the Mar family. Um, and at that time, I had people just contact me from all over the world and say, oh, my God, you are telling my story. We've been waiting for this story our whole life. Um, and it really was supposed to be just that project. The same year, I also did a 23andMe test because I knew that I was brown. I always knew I was brown. Actually, the ironic thing is, is with some beds, now people think I'm white. But <laughs> I'm brown. Um, so, you know, growing up in a small Irish town, it was really clear that I didn't look like everybody else. And I didn't really meet many other people that looked like me. Um, so it was great to be showcasing that work at that time. And I thought I'd be able to just put that away. Like, I've done it now. I've told everybody these pictures are out there. But it just didn't work like that. People were, were just, you know, they were coming from all walks of life. And one of the things that I think about when I think about the work that we do and the, 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 the community that we represent, it represents the broader community. We have people from the traveling community, from the LGBTQI community, those that actually look, I could go on, there's a whole list when we're looking at inclusion and we're thinking about who is included in those inclusive, those, those non-exclusive spaces. Um, and then the pandemic hit. We also saw the murder of George Floyd and we saw young people and we heard in the previous panel about young people and young people really are taking action these days. And at that time, people were looking at me to do something, to say something to bring our communities together because the, the community that, that we had met along the way often were brown-skinned Irish people, but they lived in Caucasian white families and they didn't always have access to the other sides of themselves. And they didn't feel like that their needs were being met or that people really understood. They didn't often feel like within their own families or were even able to raise some of the issues that they were feeling they were almost like, I, you know, I'd heard Pauline talk about um, Harry Potter, and I think I think about code switching and jumping from one space to another in order for people to really understand and to be able to be the full, authentic, your full, authentic self and to bring all of that to the forefront. Front. And so in 2019, uh, 2020, we really embarked on I Am Irish. And so I Am Irish is a not-for-profit organization that connects supports, advocates for, and highlights Irish people of mixed ancestry, multi-ethnicity, and the global majority. And I feel like I need to kind of break down what the global majority is, because I'm not going to go into lots of stuff around race theory, but when we look at those who come from Afro-Caribbean, Asian, Arab um, ancestries, they actually are the, the, the majority in the world. Um, and often when we're having conversations, it's set in whiteness. And so it's important that we're looking at the majority, not the minority. So we often hear about ethnic minorities. And, it, you know, in some Western countries, people are minorities, but actually across the globe, they're majorities. Um, and so what I'm sure that any of you that have been visiting Ireland and haven't been here for a few years and you're out and around in Dublin, you will see that the people you're meeting are not necessarily representative of who we see, like when we look at each other across the room. And when we're thinking about who's waving the flag for Ireland across the world, it's really important that we're thinking about that and we're thinking about those issues because we want to bring those stories with us. We are very proud to be Irish people. We want to be other. You know, I was in Epic yesterday and I saw Rihanna, and most people know, like, she's a global superstar. And I saw what's Rihanna's Irish, her, you know, what's her Irish name? And that's the story for lots of people that we know. And when we go back to kind of think about our people, and we have to think about our people and our values together, because 
There is lots of people across the globe that are not claiming their Irishness. So we really need to look at what does Irishness look like in 2023? What is it that young people are really valuing about being Irish? Who is it that we're counting as, as Irish? When, when I think about my own team, or I think even about individuals that I have meet and talk to, and um, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, I know they'll know who I'm talking about, but when I first met them and they were like, oh, you know, my wife is Irish, brown-skinned man, from another, you know, from, from the States, and, um, and then in conversation, heard about their Irish grandparents, but they themselves don't identify with Irish, Irishness in that way. And so I think it's really important when we're thinking about the work that we're doing and the conversations that we're having, that we're really thinking more broadly and openly. And I realise, and I'm sure you'll all know, as Irish people, we're great storytellers, so I could talk for a really long time. <laughs> I'm going to hand over. That's Thanks so much, Lorraine. Miriam, you've been involved in, in this work for a long time at this stage, so do you want to maybe... Tell us a little bit about what you've been doing. Yeah, absolutely, Eva. Thanks for be, uh, welcoming me on this panel and thank you to everyone for having me here. It's uh, wonderful and a real privilege to be here today. Um, I'm a historian by training, first generation college attendee, um, and I'm very interested in the intersectionality of race and ethnicity. I grew up on stories of my father talking about rural West Cork in the 1940s and 50s when there's this huge hemorrhage off the land of Ireland, mainly actually to Britain. And something about these stories of diaspora really, um, really inspired me. And um, it's always been something that um, I've kind of, I think also spoke to my upbringing. I grew up in Arklow County Wicklow as the son, oh, sorry, the daughter of a proud Cork man and a leash uh, mother and always this sense of being an outsider in the art law of my, my, my youth. I w we were kind of outsiders because of this, we weren't from there, et cetera, et cetera. So I've always identified with this kind of sense of being an insider and outsider, and it's animated um, the work that I've had the privilege to do over the last two decades or so. Um, I'm a bit of an itinerant uh, oral historian in terms of anywhere I go, I go, I'm likely to pull out a microphone and I've done a lot of interviews for the Archives of Irish America. I've had the great fortune and privilege of being connected to New York University's Centre for Irish Studies, Luxman Ireland House, uh, since 2008, and I'm currently a visiting scholar, and I have done a third of the interviews that comprise the collection of the Archives of Irish America. Um, I've interviewed people from all over um, Ireland, for, and people who are straight off the boat, as we might say, to people who are sixth and seventh generation Irish American and, and I also conducted interviews in Britain prior to that. But I suppose I was hitting about 40 and I was thinking, I suppose like maybe approaching some kind of a midlife crisis and thinking about legacy and thinking about the fact that when my sons get older, they'd say, God, mom, you did great work for the archives of Irish America, but you never interviewed anyone who looked like us. My husband is Jamaican American and my sons are Irish, New Yorker, now Corkonians, God love them, um, uh, citizens of the world who are very, very proud of these prongs of multi-identity that they exist in, right? So um, I thought about it and um, we had only one interview in our collection, which was of someone who looked more like Lorraine than me, right? And that's not the spirit of Luxman Ireland House, if any of you are familiar with the centre. It was founded by a wonderfully inspiring Irish American and Jewish American couple. And the whole ethos of Luxman Ireland House is about an open and embracing representation of identity. But even we, in all our work, we're not a a actually reflecting that. And that brings me to a core point of what I want to say in terms of the work we have to do. We cannot be passive in terms of building community. What I, what I realized when I started this work that I have a black Irish American colleague at NYU who lives and works right across the park from Luxman Ireland House and works on multi-ethnic multi identity. She had never crossed the threshold of Luxman Ireland House until we started doing this work. And, I, and I'm saying to myself, if someone like that, someone who's that proximate to us, 
was not part of our community were doing something wrong. So initially the work was about oral histories and capturing voices in a way complementing and in part inspired by what Lorraine was doing on the other side of the Atlantic, capturing voices. I do it better on a, an interview rather than a visual representation. But a, um, after a short period of time, it actually has become apparent to me that in fact more important than capturing the voices is the building of the community that has gone ar on around that. And now Luxman Ireland House, through the Black, Brown and Green Voices programme, out of Luxman Ireland House and in collaboration with the African, uh, African American Irish Diaspora Network, is really seen as a space in terms of building community to document, in particular, the black and brown, green, uh, black and brown voices of the Irish American experience. Lorraine spoke about like, that key person, Gary Dunn, putting up the exhibition in the London Irish Centre. He will hate me saying this, but Kieran Madden as Consul General in 2019-2020 on the ground in terms of support for this project and seeing how important it was in terms of outreach into the community was second to none and it couldn't have been oxygenated, similar to the African American Irish Diaspora Network, without that key person and without me being able to say, thank you, that's very well deserved. It, 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 it showed at a, go, at, a, at a level when I went out to try and interview people or coerce them into sitting down and doing, doing an interview to say, the Irish government believes in this. Here is our Consul General. And time after time, Kieran showed up and spoke on behalf of us here in terms of endorsing this work. And uh, it's really, really, it, it was really meaningful and is really great currency in this type, type of work. Um, so now uh, the, the pivot 2020 comes and doing face-to-face -face oral histories is not feasible. So we add a component to the project, which is public programming. So Black, Brown and Green Voices now primarily, although not exclusively, is a public programming series where I interview um, scholars, uh, activists, people who grew up of Black and Irish descent mainly in the United States, but in, in a diasporic co uh, context as well. For example, we just had the wonderful uh, black Irish British writer Kit Duvall on the other day for an interview about her memoir. And um, it's really, really forging an important community space and touchstone for people. I, almost every week, I get, interview I get in, uh, emails from people saying, I've learned about the work you're doing. I'm, you know, I'm a biracial child of a mixed marriage, and we, I never knew there were spaces that we could connect in. So on one level, and I'm very empathetic to Hillary in terms of the contracting of Irish America on one level, but we have room for expansion. It puts us into thorny places because it puts us back into dark aspects of American and imperial history. But we have to take it on, folks. We have work to do. There has been a lot going on here in the last few months in terms of anti-immigrant sentiment and discourse around belonging. We in the diaspora, and I, to be clear, I am back in Ireland, and part of the reason I am back in Ireland is to be part of this conversation where we are connecting the work that we do back into our brothers and sisters who are here six months or 60 years and are part of our community. So I think I've spoken enough. Um, thank you for the opportunity and happy to answer any questions. Thank, thanks, Miriam. And I mean, I'm sitting here and listening to all of you and I'm struck by the immense leadership that you've all shown in trying to drive the space to make, you know, make it a more inclusive and a more a real version of Ireland and, and to, to, to do that. And I think, you know, Miriam, you touched on it there, but about what do we need to do as a country to, to, to make that link between, between the, the community and the, so, the, the society that we have here in Ireland now? How do you, how do, you do those, make those linkages? And, and, and to all of you, and what can the government here do, and, and maybe through the work of, of the Irish Abroad Unit, how, what, what, what else can we do to help forge those links? Are there things that we're missing? Are there things that we, 
you know, I, I, we're, we're conscious of, of it, you know, from a, the contracting um, demographics in the US where, where, where Irish, fewer people are, are ticking the, the Irish box, it's still a lot of people, but, you know, there's a, there's, and there's no, there's no kind of ongoing or very little ongoing uh, emigration to the US now. I mean, even from a very basic level of political influence that's been mentioned already this morning is, is how, do, how, do we, how do we make those linkages? How, what do we need to do or where can we insert ourselves perhaps uh, to help with, with, with some of that? I don't know, Richard. Can, you know. can I just respond sure. to that? Just because um, all I'm hearing and what you said is the Irish box. And um, for us, part of the work that we're doing at the moment is really helping to explore the Irish box. Because for someone like me, there is no tick box that I can tick that, that equally you know, like really represents who I am. And we saw in the Irish census across Great Britain a little while ago, you know, we know that the information that's been collected is not really fit for purpose. And so for me, I think that that is one of the way that the Irish governments could really help us to really understand Irishness, particularly abroad, because um, in any monitoring form that we're ever given, and we, it's a real challenge for us, even when we're trying to fundraise, because when we talk about being an Irish community, we're automatically seen as white globally. Um, and so that I think that, you know, when if the, 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 the tick of Irishness, that what does Irishness look like, is a fundamental question for us. Anybody else want to? I think, I mean, I, I have to say, Emer, um, you know, I think just continuing to support and, and the ESB programme is, is just so great in terms of um, a commitment and energy and visibility around the work that we all do and others. Um, and if we can keep up that momentum and I, I'd really, what I'd really like to see is opp more opportunities to engage with on the ground in terms of the changing Ireland, because the reality is, you know, as people come of age here, um, people leaving Ireland and being the ambassadors of Ireland are as likely sometimes to look like my son as, as they are to look like me, right? Mm -hmm. and, and with the changing nature, you know, as, as Lorraine mentioned about demographics, with the changing nature of the United States, for example, it's on the cusp of becoming a majority minority country mm -hmm. and how that will look over time. So there's a great opportunity. I think we just need to reflect on and take ownership of the thornier aspects of our history in as much as we've been part of those stories and then celebrate the good in terms of like one of the things um you know when when i think about you know you're kind of thinking about in this work like am i making an impact there's a serious uh, book coming out in the next few months about a topic on african-american history that has an irish component to it and you know the the author is approaching me to come on the program to, to be part of this program People on the African-American side of things are, as Dennis mentioned, really energized and want to communicate back into us. So just the more we can do to enable that, I think, um, uh, the better. Thank you. Well, I, I would say um, that continuing to help facilitate these relationships is, is, is an important role for the um, Department of Foreign Affairs, for the Irish government. Um, They've been tremendously helpful in helping us launch what I've been told is now a movement, uh, you know, and, and I think that the response has, has been overwhelming when people realize that there is this legacy of a relationship between Irish and African Americans that has been positive in many respects. I think that many African Americans don't know of the positive aspects of the relationship because many Irish, when they went to America uh, in the mid 19th century, uh, adopted the institution of slavery in, in, in concept and, and supported it. It was the institution that was prevalent throughout America and not just in the South. Uh, you know, the South is where many people were enslaved uh, doing labor in, um, in, in, in the cotton industry and, and tobacco and, and, and others. Um, but people in the North were profiting from that as well. And, and the whole economic structure of America supported uh, this system of enslavement. Um, and when the Irish came over to America in the mid-19th century, uh, many of them were at the lower end of the 
uh, economic and social ladder as a result of coming over for the, as a result, result of the famine. And who did they find there but African Americans? Now, in places like Five Points in New York uh, and Savannah and a lot of the port cities in New Orleans, you know, uh, they were placed in competitive positions with African Americans for jobs and housing uh, and, 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 and survival. Uh, and when they were able to identify with the larger white majority and, and begin to move up the, the socioeconomic ladder, um, it was at the disadvantage of African Americans. And that's the experience that a lot of African Americans associate with, with the Irish, unfortunately. Um, at the same time, there were many, many communities around the country, including those in New York and Savannah and Cincinnati and, and in Chicago and Boston, where African Americans and Irish lived harmoniously together. And that's why you have such a high percentage of African Americans uh, having Irish ancestry. You know, it wasn't all a result of the oppression of slavery. And you know, unfortunately, too many people have only heard you know, the, the single narrative that is negative. You know, I mean, they, you know, they say history is told by the winners. And you know, unfortunately, I think in, in America, you know, it, it's more of the South that ended up being the winner in terms of the history that was told. And it's that narrative that is, that is played out. So I think what we need to do now is to overcome some of these, these perceptions, tell the stories, and, and Ireland can help us facilitate that. And it's not just about telling the stories, but it's actually putting programs in place that benefit people and help forge these relationships. That's why we're working in the area of educational exchanges, for example. We just completed an educational exchange between uh, University College Dublin, Smurfit School of Business, and Howard University Business School. And in February, there were 16 students from Howard who traveled to uh, Smurfit uh, for about 10 days. And then in March, uh, right at St. Patrick's Day, uh, the 16 students from Smurfit came over to Howard University. And those two groups of students bonded. Uh, they went out and visited companies. They had uh, lectures and seminars. They worked on projects together. When the students were ready, to, when, when the UCD students were ready to leave Washington, D.C. after their 10 days there, those two groups of students had bonded so much they were crying because they were, they were crying from each other. And all of them said that it was such a transformative experience for them to experience another culture and to overcome the misperceptions that they had uh, and that they had bonded for life and they felt that this was really an important chapter in their lives. And this is what we have to do more of. Uh, and this is what I think uh, DFA can help us facilitate. Great. Thank you. Might just change a little bit, tack, uh, change tack a little bit. I, we've spoken a little bit this morning about kind of the, the need for mental health supports. And, you know, I think a lot of, you know, a lot of people left Ireland because they just didn't fit in, whether it was their sexual orientation, whether it was, you know, whatever reason that they just didn't feel they belonged. Is there, is there still that need? Is that still a, a, an issue in the various communities that you represent? Or is it, has that faded or is it getting worse? I mean, I suspect I know the answer to this, but, um, but Pauline, yeah, you're I, nodding. I'm happy to pick that up. Yeah. Uh, from the Irish traveler perspective, um, I've already mentioned the high levels of suicide, mm. etc. And I think the intelligent thing to do is to disentangle uh, what is it about the erosion of family life, the pressures of modern life, COVID, et cetera, et cetera, on the effect of mental health and well-being uh, from what it is to be a, um, an excluded community, both at home in Ireland and elsewhere, particularly in the UK. And I think you know, that, that is the subject of a, a great PhD. Um, and I think really, understanding that what it feels like to have to be invisible, um, going to ethnic self-denial to be able to be successful is, is prob problematic and causes a lot of mental health issues. The fact that more than 80% of um, travelers are now living in fixed accommodation in housing means that, uh, that nomadism has been legislated um, out of almost out of existence, which causes enormous mental health issues. So I think you need to, you know, we need to analyze this as we are doing mm. in a very um, 
in a very specific way to, to look at what the drivers are and what the root causes of those mental health issues mm. are so that you can address them appropriately. Mm. Okay. Um, I think we're probably time to open up to the floor if um, anybody has questions. Okay, I can't see a thing, so that's great. Um, put the glasses on. <laughs> right, somewhere in the second table back there, waving. Thank you. Um, and forgive me for those of you that I should know that I can't see. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. So first of all, I really want to thank this panel. It's a panel I've been waiting for a long time. Growing up in Ireland, the Late Late Show was where you had these kind of discussions which led Gay Byrne, led, led the country forward. And I think it would be fantastic to see you guys on a Late Late Show to start with. <laughs> the second thing is, I live in Switzerland, which is a very diverse place. and. What, and I'm working in education. And what I uh, have been thinking about a long time, particularly in relation to my own country looking back, is how do we decolonize you know, the history curricula? How do we really get to see what has happened in our own country? Because we never see that. My daughter is a sociologist, anthropologist. This might be interesting for New York. She wrote, she's just written her, her uh, dissertation on Molly Malone, the deconstruction of the Irish identity. Uh, she wants to do a PhD if anyone is interested, but what, <laughs> what really um, strikes me is how hard it is to see your own country, how hard it is to see your own history, and I think the government can also be very helpful in this by looking and helping to look at the education and, and, and the curricula. We went, my daughter and I, the sociologists, to the Irish famine exhibition in St. Stephen's Green, and the, the man who was running it said, none of the teachers are coming here. It's a very thorny issue. And I just wanted to put that out there because what you've said for me has been one of the most important things I've heard for a long time. Great, thank you. Um, we might, <laughs> might collect, a few, collect a few more questions and then come back to the panel. I see hands over here. And I can't see behind the podium, so yes. <laughs> Who have we got over there? And you just introduce yourself, actually. Just my name is Leslie Thompson, originally from Dublin, and I live in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, my day job is in the, the technology industry, so I'm very familiar with HBCUs and trying to recruit for that industry with um, the African American, also live among the Native American population and the Mexican American population. Um, and we did a lot of work during COVID with the Navajo Nation, which was really seriously impacted, one of the worst in the nation. But my question to the panelists is, how do you engage that part of the, the diaspora, you know, they're, they're maybe first or second generation, who actually don't see that as the Irish identity. Their Irish identity and the perception and the narrative that they have is the white immigrants and that, that white community. And how do you engage them and make them not feel left out of this narrative and journey? Because I think that's what we're living and experiencing. It's a very technical population that's coming into Maricopa County in Phoenix, and they're living among these communities, but they are finding it's a different experience from the generation of Irish that have gone before them. So maybe any guidance on how to engage that part of the population would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then Sarah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Sarah Owen from the Crossway Migrant Project, uh, and now known as Crossway Irish Diaspora Support Project. Uh, Ema, I'm impressed you saw me from over there. So, right. so am I. <laughs> um, uh, I'd just like to say this panel is incredible, and it's, um, I think, mm -hmm. such an important discussion that we're having. I would just like to um, raise the point of naturalized Irish citizens. Um, People in Ireland are taking citizenship because they've lived here. They want to be able to vote. Um, they're continuing then their Irish journey and in some cases emigrating. So they're naturalized Irish citizens from all around the world. They're Irish. They have multiple heritages. Their children might completely identify as Irish and now they're going abroad. So there is a whole new group, if you like, and not a homogenous group, in fact, um, that there are opportunities for us to connect with. And I'd just be interested to know what the panel think about that and what ways they might suggest we could best do that as support organizations. Great, thanks Sarah. Um, we take one or two more? Is there any more? There's one, in the, Isabel. Oh, my eyes are actually working, it's great.
to include voices uh, like everybody up there today. It's a very different kind of a diaspora. And moving into the future, um, I really believe that uh, we have to engage with particularly third level education. Uh, Dennis spoke of the initiative bringing Howard students here uh, and, and bringing UCD students out to DC. That's really where we'll forge the infrastructure of long permanent connections between uh, Ireland and the United States, particularly in a time of reduced direct immigration. I really don't believe that our diaspora is in danger of, of weakening or failing, but I think that we have to tend to it in different ways. And, and those ways will be through education and through events like this. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Isabel. Um, does anybody want to pick up on any of the points that have been raised? Uh, I don't mind picking up on the education point, yeah. but I think it pertains to the employment issues as, as well. And I think, you know, Gosh, there are, some, there are solutions everywhere, but because there are so many structural problems in terms of uh, exclusion and actual, actual race, racism, which I, I've experienced, I've had to come off Twitter, for example, uh, because of direct racism. So you've got the structural um, issues of racism, but also um, the personalized as well. And I think, you know, unless speaking to the Irish government, but to the UK government and to any communities, unless we actually look at the reality of um, the experience of young people in our schools and colleges and universities um, as part of, I won't speak on behalf of anyone else, but as Irish travellers, um, their experience is a very negative one quite often. The journey into education is really tough and actually just then staying there for various reasons is also very, very difficult. And I know that from the inside out. I have an, an OBE for services to uh, children and young people in education. Uh, you know, I'm immersed in this area. And I think we do have to look at the reality, I think, you know, and, and, and listen to the voice of young people and their experience and learn from that and feed that back into the education system. So that honesty will also bring, you know, um, uh, healing, um, learning, and, and, and we need to get to the leaders. We need to get to the vice uh, principals and the vice, uh, you know, uh, chairs of universities and colleges um, because they need to understand that this is happening in their, under their watch, and I think we have to tackle those things first. Great. Thanks, Pauline. Um, I, I, I would say that, you know, the, the important thing in connecting with the diverse Irish diaspora globally uh, is to make sure that we are doing a good job in extending the invitation to that diverse diaspora uh, to embrace their Irish, their Irishness, <laughs> that Irish part of their heritage. And, and that was the case with me, you know. Uh, in the United States, you know, African Americans uh, I mean, it, it was such that at, at one point, uh, if you had one drop of black blood, you were considered black. Mm -hmm. And then you were subject to enslavement, you were subject to Jim Crow laws, and all kinds of discrimination. And so the feeling on the part of so many African Americans was that you had no connection to that part of your ancestry, or that part of who you, who you, who you are. And the, the significance to me is that once I was liberated to embrace, you know, whatever percentage of Irishness I have, it helped me understand more who I am and what legacy existed in my family and to connect to a part of a culture that helped me make who, me who I am. And, and so I think this is the important part, that we have to communicate, you know, to people that, you know, you can embrace you know, every part of who you are. You know, at the EPIC Museum, uh, you know, EPIC stands for essentially the uh, epic migration of Irish throughout the world. But it, the, the, the acronym EPIC also represents every person is connected. And I think that's what we all have to remember. At the base of it, you know, as, as Lenny Sloan, one of our board members who's done a lot of work in this area says, if almost 40% of African Americans have some Irish ancestry, 
how many Irish have some African American ancestry too? <laughs> so, so I think these are the messages we have to, to, to think of. And, and, and institutionally, we have to create those channels to embrace the, 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 the entire diaspora. Um, I don't know if either of you want to pick it up, and I'm, I'm conscious we're standing between this large room of people and their lunch, um, <laughs> but maybe, do you want to, in closing remarks, maybe? Yeah. Oh, I don't know, there's so much to respond to there, Yeah, no. I, it, I was just thinking about all the healing that's needed. Yeah. You know, I've heard about the, the decolonization, like, that is just so massive. That is, that's been your whole day to even just talk about that and what that means. Mm -hmm. We need to look at how we treat the traveler community in Ireland, that even, you know, uh, before, when we're, when we're looking at who we are as our communities, we really need to be thinking about all of those that are born and bred in Ireland and going abroad and, and can't feel confident in saying that I'm Irish because somebody else says, no, you're not. You know, we get those stories all the time. And, uh, you know, I, I was smiling there when you were talking about the, the horrible bleeding trolls on Twitter. And I think sometimes about, I don't want to, like, highlight anyone, but sometimes, you know, we get Irish Americans who are, like, 10 generations removed who really feel and embrace everything it is to be Irish. And yet we'll look at somebody who was born here to a white Irish mother who has ancestors who have been in Ireland for generations and still say, you don't belong here. And, you know, having to be that resilient all the time across the, the world, people are scared of all those knockbacks because we've lived with them for so long. Um, and it's not just about having a lovely poster that says, you belong here. It's about building those relationships. People are people. And if you are that person that consistently, even when the person is saying, you know what, I don't know, I don't know if I want to come in yet, go out to them. Work with them in their own spaces, in their own communities. Think about, you know, it's great that we've been brought together, but sometimes I do fear that when we think about diversity and inclusion, that we're all just pushed in together. You know, like in the, in the UK, we've been talking about BAME, and we're not all BAME because the needs of the South Asian community is very different to the needs of the African Caribbean community. And the work that we do is working with all of those actually that feel like they don't fit in anywhere else. And I have to tell you, there are a lot of people out there that really want to be in Irish spaces, but just unfortunately don't always feel like that they fit in there. And, you know, they're the coming in. And, and, and what I have found is, is that most leaders really want to, that everybody is open and they're embracive but you have to create the resources in order to be able to do that. When we're looking at our education system, I haven't met a teacher that doesn't want to be more embracive, be more inclusive, but sometimes they just don't know how to. So they need more resources, they need training, they need support, they need to be able to connect, and we need organizations to continue to talk to each other and talk, you know, pull resources, partner with each other, look to Ireland, because, and, and I think that we need to do a little bit more to get it right here, because, you know, if, when we're not, if we're not getting it right on the ground, how do we get it right abroad? Thank you, Brian. Miriam, final? Um, yeah, I mean, e everything Lorraine said, but just, you know, we have a tremendous opportunity. This is an amazing time in Ireland. We have made so many positive changes to our society. We've, we've things to improve on. That's absolutely clear in terms of tr Irish travelers in particular, people of color, but if we're honest, that if we're honest and we're open to the conversation, and you tentacles of the diaspora, I won't say all the best have left because I've came, come back. But that we, the people in this room, and the support from, I have to say, you know, that my NYU colleagues who work on Italian diaspora and Jewish diaspora, when I showed them that the, the strategy there is in front of you on the table, we're doing a good job. We've more to do, but it's a very optimistic moment. And, you know, we just have to keep pushing and keep collaborating and, 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 and building those partnerships. And I, I, think we can, I think we can be optimistic about it uh, as we look to the future. Thanks, Miriam. Um, 
I think that's it's a lovely it's lovely to finish on such a, an optimistic note. I just want to thank you all for your honesty, your personal and collective resilience and leadership. I think is, has just shown how much can can be done. Um, my key takeaway from it has probably been the extending the invitation. And I think that's the piece that we need to do is we need to. To, to extend the invitation more and, as you say, work in places where, where other people are. That's what I've taken out of this panel, which I think, as you say, we could talk for hours about. But uh, thank you all. I'd like to thank all of the panelists, Pauline, Dennis, Lorraine, and Miriam. Thank you so much. I won't keep you too much longer because lunch is on the way, but just to mark your cards that uh, at two o'clock we're back for the breakout sessions. If you haven't seen it by now, just switch your name card around and you'll see which room you're in for the breakout sessions. So they start from two o'clock. And remember as well, there is that optional talk at 20 past one uh, by Dr. Catherine Healy on recovering the voices of Irish uh, female emigrants, which should be really interesting. But it is time for lunch, everyone.